All right, so one more welcome. And uh, I'm happy to, to have you all here today with us. And uh, I'm Oksana Mishina. Uh, I work in Italy, in Italian National Institute of Optics. And I will be moderating this session together with Rainer Muller, who is from Technical University of Braunschweig. And both of us are part of the team of the QT2 coordination and support action that will be introduced uh, shortly with a bit more details. And before we dive into our exciting program, now the slides don't go. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I would like to just summarize a little bit what else we have in the program of this long uh, conference. This is the first workshop dedicated to education and training. So we are here now at uh, workshop 3.2 about school and outreach. And we will have a second workshop also today that will be dedicated to higher education. And um, in between, actually, like a lunch break, there will be also a parallel poster session where we have a lot of posters about education and training as well. So this is an intense today with three spots and tomorrow will be also very interesting because in the morning we will have a third and final workshop of the education uh, education team that will be dedicated to the workforce training. We will have it actually joined with a decide game that will follow afterwards. So please stay on and play. And uh, this workshop is special because it will be like a closing one. And we will also invite, we'd also like to invite all of you uh, to participate in contribution to a, a starting of a roadmap for the future, uh, towards the future quantum literacy and workshop. And then we will also have a summarize of all three workshops in there, so it will be like a little closing at the end. And the last one will be a panel discussion, which we will have in the afternoon tomorrow. And there we will have an invited talk of general um, education and training uh, points and a panel discussion with uh, four panelists. So I hope that you will stay tuned with us uh, during the whole uh, two days. And today we have a, a very rich program that will uh, start uh, with an introduction, a short introduction about the progress of this quantum technology education coordination and support action project that uh, we are running since a year already. And then we will have two parts. The first part will be dedicated to an outreach where we will have an invited talk and then we will have a presentation of a pilot project that has been launched this summer and this topic and then a contributed scientific talk. So after these three talks, we will have a question and answer session, which will be dedicated to all three talks. And uh, so this is a little special thing, which is uh, slightly different that we will not have it after each talk. After the outreach session will be done, we will have a five minute break just to breathe a little bit uh, up, uh, up to, after this. And we will start the next session that will be chaired by Reiner at this point, And it will be about the school education. The structure is the same, just that we will have more talks. So there will be an invited talk. There will be more post pilot project presentations, a contributed talk as well, and the question and answer session in the end. And after these nice uh, two sessions, we will have a do the community discussion on, on these topics. So at this final part, we will be able to really talk and, and, and open our microphones. So for the question and answer session, I ask you to write questions in the, in the, in the chat uh, and I will uh, read them and uh, moderate them to the speakers. That All right. So I think we are ready for the start. And we will have a little bit of fun <laughs> to start with. And now nothing goes on. Let me, here we go. Please enjoy the music. <laughs> Uh, 
I hope you liked it. And uh, it's a pleasure to profit uh, a great occasion, which was a G20. Uh, this year it happened in, in Fiesta in Italy. And uh, it was a broadcast of a very nice concert of just music and uh, it was gone through a secured communication link that was first done between three uh, cities and between ministers of these uh, three countries. And it is a big step forward for the quantum technology in the communication line, but uh, also very nice occasion to enjoy the music. So after this attention getter, uh, I will pass towards the introduction of the QT2 uh, coordination and support action. This had to be done by Jakob Scherson, which is also in our team, but unfortunately today he had to join another important uh, meeting about the future launched calls and uh, I will do this presentation instead of him. So the QT2 uh, coordination and support action project started a year ago and uh, how did it all start to begin with we all know that uh, there is a big investment now into the quantum technology and there is a big expectation also that they will bring to the society and the investment is a very important key point but a specialized workforce is an essential bottleneck for this to happen as currently we don't have enough specialists that will build these uh, devices. Thus, in the strategic research agenda that was issued in 2020, it was uh, clearly stated that we need to build an ecosystem for skilled quantum workforce and uh, provide also a well, uh, 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 enough information to the society that it is well informed about the, the progress. So it was also requested, in fact, that there is a coordination and support action launched to coordinate the activities in this diverse ecosystem. Uh, and this is how the QT2 project was uh, launched and uh, it has following the strategic research agenda, quite clear objectives. First was the community building and support to the community, a technical support as well. Then uh, we planned to launch uh, a set of pan-European pilot projects that will start to really scale up the, 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 the education uh, offers in Europe. And then, uh, of course, we wish to to continue the bottom-up construction of a roadmap for the pan-European workforce with the help of the community that is building. The important thing is that community is very diverse here. It consists of academics and in academia we have quantum technology researchers and uh, physics education researchers that are really fertile for, for the task of producing and training workforce and also the industry component that uh, needs to be connected to academia at this point because students need internships in, in, in companies. And uh, practically the team that we have now is, uh, is a 12 people and we are in four nodes in Italy and in Germany, in Netherlands and in Denmark. And Let's see what actions we have done by now in this year. So following the community building needs, we created five working groups, uh, each of which dedicated to different level of education, so primary school and secondary, higher education and workforce, and to transversal working groups, one dedicated to education research and one dedicated to equity and inclusion. And when we launched the groups, uh, last uh, March, we had 251 members from 32 countries, and during the run of a half a year after that, we came to 36 countries uh, coverage and 325 members. Please join us uh, if you are not yet in the in the in, a, in the working groups. The second action was to collect and share resources in, uh, in, in repositories uh, so that the community can uh, profit of what has been already built and also to share with, uh, with, with a larger public the opportunities for education and resources they have. 
So on this line, we have already uh, four databases that are collecting. One collects programs, education programs, and the other collects materials and tools that can be used in various education offers. Then one collects internships uh, that students can do in the companies or in research institutions, and events that are dedicated to education and outreach. I just want to briefly show you uh, one of the databases. For example, by August, we had 55 opportunities in education distributed over 19 countries. And today, uh, we already have 70 and uh, they are distributed over 21 countries. So this continues to, to grow this database. And I invite you to, to, to share opportunities that you provide as well. The second action that we that we uh, concentrated on was finding a common language for competences and skills in quantum technologies. And the goal was to create a, a, a map, a competence framework that maps out the landscape of possible uh, competences in quantum technologies. So we went through a three-stage TELFI study um, and uh, other larger community and also expert interviews. And we are we have launched the, the first version of the competence framework that is now available to download. And uh, I would like to announce that today in the afternoon session about the higher education, there will be a talk of Francisca uh, Grignier about this, uh, about this competence framework in details. Next action that I want to bring to light is scaling up the education offers in Europe. And this is about the pilot projects uh, program uh, that we have uh, initiated within the CSA. So we initially thought of five types of pilot programs, which are dedicated to mastering QT, minoring QT, industry retraining, outreach and school, uh, secondary school levels. And we are really grateful that after a long uh, and intensive work within the community, we had uh, 11 programs launched and uh, over 25 countries, the participants uh, in this program, in these projects, and um, a lot of members uh, take part in, in this activity. Now, they are distributed in such way uh, among the areas. And actually in this uh, session today, we will talk, we will see the presentations of the outreach uh, pilot project and the presentation of the projects for secondary uh, schools. I think uh, we are almost at the end. I just want to have a quick announcement that we are preparing to launch a new website with more repositories at the, at the help and the member area where members can, can, can log in and, and see their profile and other members that are, have common interests. So stay tuned and, uh, and, uh, and um, follow us. One more, one more thing, which is in March next year, we are planning to have working groups of the QTDO uh, meetings of the QTDO working groups. It will be the week from 7 to 11 March. So save the date uh, if you are interested to, to be uh, involved. And an outreach event that will be yearly now as the Quantum World Day on 14 April was established last year worldwide. Here we are done with the introduction. Join the community if you're now with us. And uh, uh, I will now pass the, 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 the stage to the first presenter of uh, our meeting. And uh, uh, I invite um, Marilu Kenfalo to present, uh, to, to, to give an invited talk about the uh, outreach uh, initiatives and challenges in this, uh, in this field. Hi, Oksana. Hello, everyone. I'm uh, really uh, very happy to be here in this uh, context. Uh, and I think that uh, the quantum technology education uh, 
coordination support action uh, had a great idea uh, to uh, organize this session in EQTC. So I also would like to thank uh, EQTC. I'm going to uh, share my presentation uh, that as uh, Oksana was uh, uh, anticipating, uh, is about uh, massive education and outreach in quantum physics and technologies, uh, challenges and uh, uh, perspectives. Uh, so um, the, um, uh, the first uh, uh, point uh, uh, that I want to share uh, I'm, I'm, uh, with, with this presentation, uh, essentially, I will try to provide a kind of a systematic view, but also to spread uh, and disseminate uh, seeds for uh, thoughts sprouting. Uh, and uh, so in a way to provide an open structured view of the subject. And so, but first of all, we should understand why is this uh, uh, outreach and massive outreach and education uh, on quantum technologies important. And of course, uh, one uh, main uh, uh, motivation is that the second quantum revolution is pervading uh, our everyday lives. And this is about uh, every single corner of uh, the EQTC uh, conference uh, is uh, uh, um, disseminated, so I won't uh, uh, stand on uh, this, uh, while I will focus on the extraordinary educational opportunity that uh, this brings uh, uh, with, with it. And uh, uh, the first point uh, uh, is about how education, uh, physics education uh, in uh, general works. And uh, of course, we have to uh, remind ourselves how physics uh, thinking works. And we know that it starts from observation of facts and anali uh, analysis and facts uh, and also fact checking uh, that uh, uh, via some form of experimental literacy uh, leads to creative thinking, to, uh, uh, to uh, create hypotheses uh, and uh, theories uh, that explain the phenomena we observe. And then we, uh, via some form of symbolic uh, uh, literacy that can involve maths or visual thinking or, or other, uh, we get into the formalization that allows us to uh, have quantitative uh, uh, predictions uh, about uh, uh, fr from our theories, then, then uh, again, uh, via some form of experimental literacy, uh, uh, should be checked uh, in uh, further experiments. Something that is uh, shared uh, also with artistic thinking in a, in a way, no, even though it is not a really one-to-one -one mapping. Now, the problem is that uh, mm, uh, even uh, in uh, uh, classical uh, physics uh, uh, teaching, uh, too much often uh, the, 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 the physics teaching uh, is realized in a deductive manner. So starting uh, from equations and then uh, uh, trying to get to the, to the observation and fact checking. And of course, uh, uh, by this doing, uh, uh, we are really uh, uh, taking away the most interesting part of the story. And also we are uh, alterating in a, in a uh, non-functional manner the, uh, the education to scientific thinking. Of course, uh, with quantum physics, this is even uh, worse uh, because uh, uh, for quantum physics, uh, physics and in quantum physics, uh, the math and the formal uh, apparatus that we need is even more complicated, even for uh, high schools. And so uh, we are uh, in, the, in a situation, in a stuck situation where we really uh, become unable uh, to uh, realize uh, good and uh, effective and efficient uh, uh, physics education uh, and uh, uh, learning uh, teaching processes. So um, uh, here I would like to share, uh, first of all, a few um, inspiring ideas, uh, at least ideas that have been inspiring for me in this game. And uh, the first is about uh, Howard Gardner and multiple intelligence theory. Um, our Gardner says that uh, uh, discriminates between abilities, uh, competencies that are abilities of which we are aware, and intelligences that are competencies uh, that we are able to play into a in relationship to a context. And in fact, intelligence uh, uh, in the in his kind of definition is a bio uh, psychological potential to process inf information that is activated in a cultural context and is uh, used to solve the problems and create products that are valuable for that cultural context. And uh, in this way, uh, intelligence uh, is a unique uh, 
because uh, it is a unique composition of many intelligences. Uh, Gardner uh, arrives at defining uh, something like introducing something like 10 different kind of uh, intelligences. <clears throat> it is always evolving because uh, it is uh, something that uh, <clears throat> develops in relationship with the context we are uh, um, in uh, implies more languages indeed, and uh, technologies can be developed to support and compensate for language, uh, language difficulties. Uh, disciplines in this view are means and not aims. Uh, intelligence is distributed. Uh, let's imagine uh, the intelligence of one single person versus the intelligence of a community. And uh, we can also remind uh, the citizen science approaches to research that are currently uh, overspreading. And also it's not measurable, measurable with a number, with a QI. Uh, another inspiring idea is uh, the one about uh, five minds for future. Uh, Gardner says that uh, um, we have the, the, the um, uh, humanity, the humankind that uh, will uh, uh, um, uh, live in the future uh, has to develop five kind of minds. The disciplined uh, mind, uh, and he uh, thinks about uh, three main disciplines, uh, history, science and maths and arts. The synthesizing mind that it is important, uh, uh, fundamental to, uh, uh, to get the essential information out of a huge amount of information that we are, uh, at, uh, that is at reach uh, nowadays. The creative mind that it is for solving problems we never uh, met before. And the respectful mind, because uh, nothing can be uh, good if uh, uh, we don't respect others, and the ethic mind, because uh, what we do, we can be most intelligent persons, but uh, uh, and uh, create the most intelligent tools, but uh, if these are not for good, uh, this is uh, meaningless. And so these uh, requires uh, these ideas are inspired for us, inspiring for us, because. Uh, you see, discipline mind means that we need to educate uh, with respect to quantum physics uh, to use a uh, uh, pro progressively complex disciplinary language because this is something that the technical at the, at the very end to make quantitative predictions we need. But we also have to educate to synthesis and creativity. And uh, we also have to educate with a responsible research and innovation approach. And uh, here I'd like to just to uh, give, a, give you a, a, a screenshot about uh, the six dimensions of responsible research innovation uh, that are now pervading uh, the, um, uh, our universities and academic system, fortunately, uh, as an approach uh, to uh, uh, teaching, to research and also to outreach. Now, uh, how we want to do this? Well, uh, of course, we want to um, uh, do this education in all possible uh, uh, educational contexts, formal and non-formal contexts. They could be schools, general public, policy makers, otherwise how they can see and understand why quantum technologies are important, and also companies who are entering the, uh, the world of quantum and the economy of quantum technologies. And we, will, we also want to go uh, in the direction of time, so educate everyone from zero to 99, so to speak, years old. And so we want to fill up all this space. And there is only one way to do this. There is a one starting point that we cannot avoid, and this is engagement. Now, uh, what shall we educate uh, all these persons in different con contents, uh, contexts to? Um, there is a, a, a dichotomy, apparent dichotomy, um, uh, that is about whether we should educate to basic quantum concepts or to quantum technology. So this is uh, an open uh, discussion, even in our uh, QTEDU uh, uh, community. But this is a, a kind of a fake problem. And uh, I want to uh, share with you uh, why, um, considering another inspiring, uh, um, uh, inspiring idea that is uh, the one of Lou Bloomfield, uh, who in 2007 has uh, uh, conceived this uh, way of uh, teaching physics uh, that, is, uh, um, that is contained in uh, uh, How Things Work, uh, uh, book and all the resources. And the idea is, is very simple. When we have to teach physics, 
In fact, we want to, um, uh, from the perspective of the teacher, we want to cover a full syllabus, a full program. But from the point of view of the students or the learners, we have to engage them. And so it is better to start from how, how phenomena are uh, and how objects from everyday life, uh, they work. And in common between teachers and le learners are, of course, the concepts of physics. So, for example, this is uh, a screenshot from the book of uh, Lou, um, where it is clear that if we want, uh, we have a kind of double index, uh, because uh, if we want to uh, if we want to, for example, to educate to uh, the concept of resonance, we can uh, talk about clocks, musical instruments, or how the sea work. And of course, uh, it's not really immaterial about how we choose the objects and phenomena. Okay, but uh, then uh, uh, what can be the storytelling strategy? Um, I, uh, I'm going to uh, tell you something I've been uh, working at uh, uh, more recently in, in the classical physics domain, uh, and uh, then I will extend it to quantum physics very shortly. Um, the idea is the, the following. We have to restore uh, the normal flow of uh, uh, physics thinking uh, that is that starts from observation, then goes to uh, cre uh, creation of hypothesis, and then some kind of formalization that will depend on the degree of uh, formal tools that our audience has. And so we can do this uh, with single essential concepts uh, here uh, that, uh, uh, that uh, can be story told precisely starting from everyday life phenomena. So for example, the concept of a position or the concept of entanglement in quantum physics. And then uh, we, having all these, uh, uh, these uh, um, storytelling about a single concepts, so we, we can create macro stories or hyper macro stories that, uh, uh, that train uh, the audience also to the use of the problem solving uh, process uh, that is typical of physics thinking. And uh, this is about the procedural knowledge. Uh, this idea of conceptual, procedural and factual knowledge is from uh, Randall Knight experience. So for for example, in our quantum technology education, we can, uh, our macro story example can be how a qubit can be made out of a cold atom uh, platform works. And the micro story examples, I mean, to, under to understand how a qubit works, we will have to introduce uh, single concepts. Uh, for, so, for example, quantum state, superposition, entanglement. But the point is that, that for every one of these concepts, uh, micro story or macro story, uh, we will use uh, the correct uh, uh, physics thinking process that starts from observation, then goes to creativity, some form, if possible, of formalization and back to observation. So here it is a not exhaustive uh, list of existing resources uh, for quantum physics and quantum technologies education. We have platforms uh, you can read uh, and there are also links uh, to every one of these uh, um, websites, interactive resources, uh, collection of interactive resources. Uh, these are European and US in particular, but there are also other ones. There are quantum physics uh, uh, labs for concepts and for virtual uh, labs. Uh, there are uh, quantum algorithms labs and uh, resources related to it. There are uh, quantum games uh, that are made also from quantum game jumps, but also educational tangible objects for, for K-12 experience activities. I'm listing uh, uh, from, uh, uh, from uh, um, a, a paper that we are writing within the, Q, uh, uh, the quantum technologies education for everyone uh, pilot project. And then we have quantum pills and animations, artistic immersive experiences, and online courses for different types of beneficiaries. Now, how to use all this? And uh, the idea is uh, simple. If we have to uh, start from the observation of facts, analysis, and checking, then we are, we are going to use the virtual labs. Uh, and uh, like, for example, you know, quantum flight trap, uh, VQ all uh, and Lobster uh, to make some examples or quantum games. Uh, here are two examples, so two out of so many, Tic Tac Two Quantum and uh, Psi and Delta. If, uh, or we can also use animations, quantum pills or interactive uh, uh, arts uh, um, experiences uh, in the case in which uh, we are uh, talking to, uh, for example, a, a kindergarten audience or a general public audience. 
uh, and also quantum uh, physics and quantum concept algorithmic labs. If we have to uh, go into creativity, we can use animations uh, or quantum pills or artistic immersive experiences. Here uh, is the quantum jungle we have just inaugurated in Pisa, where you see the collapse of the quantum state after a measurement, for example, just to give a, an idea. And then if we are going to for the most formalization, we can use the quantum physics concepts labs like quantum moves or the algorithmic labs like quantum odyssey or Qiskit, but also quantum games. And of course, finally, if we are in the right place, we can also use math. And so where are we going? Then I'm go going to finish uh, for Oksana uh, because my time is going to uh, end. So which are eventually the opportunities we, are, we have in front of us? Uh, we can rethink uh, our uh, uh, physics teaching way, uh, not only the quantum physics teaching, but also the, phys the, the overall physics te teaching, because quantum physics teaching and quantum technology education really forces us to uh, change that uh, uh, deductive manner of teaching physics uh, to go back uh, to the real process of physics thinking. Uh, we have the opportunity to rethink uh, quantum, our quantum research tools. Uh, let's imagine uh, also to uh, all the use that we can have also of uh, these interactive uh, arts uh, experiences uh, like the quantum jungle or the quantum moves, uh, these quantum concepts lab labs in our research environment. And of course, uh, also outreach that uh, becomes centered on education. And in this way, we can empower formal and informal learnings and uh, enhance our intelligence in attracting diverse audiences via engagement, introducing teaching and following on research. The challenges are how to do this without math and experimental literacy, uh, the accessibility, the quality versus the quantum junk, there is much around uh, internet, and also about how to uh, uh, devise measurement tools, uh, because we are scientists, we want to measure the efficiency, the effectiveness of our uh, ideas, uh, the responsible research and innovation dimensions. And for all this, I really refer to the next uh, coming uh, uh, talk by uh, my uh, Zeki Siskir uh, from uh, the QTE4E uh, uh, environment. And with this, uh, I'd like uh, to thank, uh, of course, the fantastic uh, QTDU coordination team and the brilliant community of uh, the, my pilot partners uh, I've been thinking to these ideas for a long uh, time, but uh, they are, have really been boosted during this year of collaboration within this community. And of course, thanks to every one of you for your attention. Many thanks, Marilu, for this uh, super inspiring talk and for sharing uh, a lot of uh, great ideas. And uh, I have to say that my first introduction of the first speaker was a little bit cumbersome after everything. And uh, I apologize for not saying that Marilou is uh, in the Pisa University and the physics department. And uh, as she invited the next speaker already to the stage, I only want to add that he together with Marilou coordinates uh, one of the pilot projects that was launched in the Kitidu community. And this pilot project is uh, dedicated to the, to the outreach. Then uh, Zeki is um, at the Department of Physics uh, in Meto in uh, Turkey. Welcome Zeki, uh, please the uh, stage is uh, yours. Hi, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we hear you well. Okay, perfect. And can you see my slides? Yes, they are on screen. Okay, thank you. That's perfect. Uh, so, hello everyone. Uh, and thank you, Marilu, for the fantastic talk and the wonderful introduction. Uh, I hope that I don't disappoint you. Uh, and today uh, I'll be presenting the uh, QTEDU Open Outreach Pilot, Quantum Technologies Education for Everyone. Uh, and as mentioned, my name is Zeki, uh, and today I'm here representing QWorld, a coordinating partner of the QTE4E pilot. And, uh, well, let's begin. Uh, Let's start with mentioning uh, who we are in the pilot. You can see many of the organizations 
uh, here. Uh, and actually, we have 30 participants from uh, 12 different countries uh, representing many uh, different organizations with uh, some partners having multiple affiliations, as you can see here. And uh, in the pilot, we actually have four main pillars or synergetic actions, as we call them. And each synergetic action has uh, certain uh, sub-actions, but I will only go uh, in the overall uh, synergetic actions here. The first one is to produce uh, an essential syllabus of quantum physics concepts to be outreached and of their main applications to quantum technology. So this is uh, what Marilu is uh, basically leading uh, in the pilot and uh, it, it is a wonderful initiative. Uh, the second uh, main synergetic action is to conduct a Delphi study uh, with QTE EDU participants and associated parties uh, to identify the stakeholders, problems and opportunities in outreach activities uh, in quantum technologies. Uh, and uh, this is mainly uh, le uh, led by me, uh, but also other uh, pilot members as well. Uh, our third synergetic action with many, many sub-actions is to realize joint outreach activities, which I will uh, come to in a minute. And the fourth one is to formulate and implement uh, RRI dimensions into the pilot activities that is responsible research and innovation. And Marlo uh, already uh, covered that uh, rather nicely. So what have we done so far? Uh, first of all, we had the wonderful European Researchers Night QTE 4E edition. Uh, you can find the videos on our uh, YouTube channel, and it was uh, a very nice panel uh, with uh, several talks. Uh, one of them was on RRI, and mainly we discussed uh, uh, opportunities for uh, education and outreach in quantum technologies. Uh, also, we uh, organized and helped organize some quantum games hackathons. Uh, one of them was in Poland, one of them is in Turkey, and also uh, one of them uh, was in Pisa, and I will come to that in a minute. And the uh, other thing that was done uh, during the pe period that was the pilot is active uh, is the inauguration of Quantum Jungle, and Marilu also covered that uh, rather beautifully. Uh, as mentioned, uh, we helped... Uh, we played a small role in the Internet Festival's Quantum Game Jam 2021. Uh, it was a non-competitive uh, quantum game development uh, event uh, with several uh, experts uh, for juries to give feedback. And also we organized an event called Desktop Quantum Games. Uh, as you can see, we focus mainly on games. Uh, and the reason is uh, we believe quantum games to be rather unique opportunity for outreach uh, that is connected to education. And also, uh, we completed the preliminary uh, round of our Delphi study uh, on uh, quantum outreach, stakeholders, opportunities, problems, and solutions uh, until now. So what are we planning to do? Uh, again, as Marilu mentioned, we are uh, writing a paper on quantum games and interactive tools for quantum technologies, outreach and education. We have many partners within and outside of the pilot uh, sharing their experiences from the field. Uh, we hope to get this paper published in an open access form uh, so that everyone can access it, but also we will put it on archive. So regardless uh, of the publication, everyone will be able to access it. Uh, also, we are continuing with the RRI dimension. We will have an event uh, titled Responsible Quantum Technologies uh, on 9th of December. Uh, it will be an online event and everybody is uh, welcome to join. Uh, it is not publicized yet, but uh, you can just reach out to me uh, if you wish to be a part of it. Also, there will be an uh, hopefully on-site, if Corona uh, allows, uh, RRI training event with PhD students at the University of Pisa. Uh, 
and we will continue with our Delphi study. Uh, the first round will be internal to the QTEDU members, but the second round will be open to uh, all public. And finally, uh, as mentioned previously, we will have the Quantum Week 2022, uh, which will cover many uh, outreach uh, activities. And uh, if you want to reach us, you can either reach to Marilu, me or Kaita. Uh, also, we have this uh, email account qte 4 e at gmail.com. Uh, we would be happy to get in contact with you. And I will stop sharing so that we will have enough or even more time for the Q&A session. Many thanks, Jackie, for sharing the great uh, things you are doing within the QTE uh, for, for E. And, uh, and um, thanks for being in time. This is precious now as, uh, as uh, we are rolling a little bit off. And um, uh, keep your questions to the quick question and answer session that will come uh, after our final uh, presentation of this part. And now I invite uh, to the stage Filippo Payota from the Department of Science uh, and High Technology at the University of Insubria in Italy. And Filippo will talk us about bringing the second quantum revolution into high school. Welcome, Filippo. Welcome, everybody. Hope you can hear me. Um, so uh, my name is Filippo Payota, and on behalf of Maria Bondani, we would like to um, contributed to the discussion of this workshop, uh, sharing with you the results of our collab the collaboration we had with a group of high school physics teachers um, and uh, the activities we implemented with high school um, students here in Italy in the, in the, in the, in the Como school district. Uh, well, our project refers to a specific need. On one side, um, we have the, uh, the scientific competencies that students in high school need to develop, uh, so to be able to understand uh, and evaluate the impact of science and technology in society. And on the other side, we know that um, a scientific revolution is taking place, and this process is opening um, new possibility and, and it's also changing our vision of reality. But unfortunately, most of our um, teachers and students are not fully aware of it. And therefore we need to bridge the gap. So the, the aim of our project is to generate the conditions to make high school teachers and students feel part of the second point revolution. So we want to investigate how to foster quantum awareness in the learning ecosystem in which teachers and students are used to learn. Um, if we do so, uh, we'll be able to hit different targets. Um, the, the institutional requirements that ask students to be able to understand the role of science and technology. Uh, we can also have an impact on the cultural capital of teaching students, uh, no matter of their future career choices. And that will be beneficial for the entire community in the sense that it can help um, the development of different uh, transversal skills. Um, so um, to do so, the strategy uh, was to promote the collaboration um, between different elements of the learning ecosystem uh, with the idea of introducing key elements of the second quantum revolution into regular classroom activities. So to do so, uh, the different action we, we implemented was the design of professional development program for teachers and the result of those uh, PD program will be used to co-design classroom activities run and implemented by the teachers. And we also gave the, the students the opportunity to participate in extracurricular activities related to quantum technologies. Um, the way we organize content and topics refers to the tenets of quantum information. Um, although quantum information and quantum theory in general is a, an axiomatic theory, we are aware we cannot introduce them uh, that axioms and that approach directly to in, into high school because of the a higher level of, um, of um, structure that is required. And so we focus our attention to um, specific core concept 
and we represent them using uh, specific uh, mathematical or visual representation, and that can be used to analyze uh, experimental results. The idea is that the basic axiom will emerge from the uh, interpretative process of uh, the experiment, and those axioms look like the rules of the game that uh, quantum objects follow. With those rules in their hands, uh, teachers and students can then explore the world of quantum technologies. Um, this is a um, um, sort of um, vision of our timeline of different activities we implemented. On the bottom left, you see the Quantum Jump project. Um, is a professional development project for program for and service uh, high school physics teachers. And with the during the, the, the PD, we had the opportunity to discuss with teachers about how, how what, are the, what are the challenges in teaching, in teaching quantum physics at high, at high school level. And we also had the opportunity to engage them in the co-design activities of um, a classroom uh, physics activity they, they, that they've implemented with their own classroom in the, um, in the spring of 2021. At the same time, we offer the opportunity for students and teachers to participate in extracurricular activities, specifically on uh, quantum technology. I will show you how we, we did that uh, later. At the same time, in a different timeline, you know, like in the Marvel Universe, we had the opportunity to work in collaboration with a um, different research group in Italy uh, to create what is called uh, a transversal competencies and school orientation program. In Italy, it's called PCTO. That is a mandatory activity that students need to, um, to do in Italy. And um, we have been able to, um, uh, to engage more than um, 270 students uh, in um, participating in lectures about uh, quantum technologies and they also have been able to participate and be engaged into a specific workshop. I will, I will give you some detail of that later. Um, about the, the work we did with the, uh, with the new teachers. So we uh, start from the classical models and we introduce mathematical representation um, like vectors and matrices that are part of the Italian maths curriculum. And we analyze different experiments to argue the need of uh, uh, quantum vision. Of, uh, of, of reality. Uh, that is part of the mandatory uh, requirement for instruction, uh, physics instruction in Italy. Um, the ideas of quantum states and qubits are the pivotal uh, concept that we use um, uh, to help um, move from the classical to quantum paradigm of interpretation of physical phenomena. The idea was not to give teachers a recipe to follow, but the ingredients that can be used to design their activities following their own um, teaching style. And so these are some results of the, of the activity that some teachers do um, as a sort of in merging some uh, laboratory experiments with some group discussion with the students, always from, to um, support the transition from the classical description to quantum objects or, or object, physical object to quantum description of um, quantum object. Um, and so uh, in tackling some um, difficult concept like duality, for example. They also work about um, uh, the nature of light, moving from the classical nature of light to quantum, uh, to quantum light. Um, these are the, these are the way in which teacher use what we um, discussed, uh, what we introduced them in, to, to them in the professional development program, um, to um, introduce in their class in their activity with students uh, the basic concept of um, of quantum theory um, in a more contemporary way. Um, as you can see here, uh, there's, there's no uh, explicit reference to quantum technology. Um, the, the teachers we work with were very keen to introduce more quantum modules in their teaching next year. Um, but it's, it, it's important anyway, because um, it, it proves that we can uh, introduce in regular classroom activity the basic tools that can maybe able can be then have been used to explore how quantum technology works. And 
And we, we, we had the opportunity to work with students in more detail about quantum technologies during our summer school. So moving to uh, the extracurricular activities, um, we had um, last year and a half, uh, we promote free uh, summer schools for students um, and, and we invite teachers to participate. Um, we, um, the, 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 we, the use of the penny flip game, uh, we start exploration of what makes the quantum computing different from classical computing. And uh, we gradually introduce different mathematical representation, in particular direct notation, um, as a tool uh, to analyze the computational structure of quantum, a description of uh, the behavior of quantum objects. Um, and using an uh, informational approach. And so we consider the quantum state as all the information that uh, we have about the physical object and um, how this system is modified by the interaction with uh, specific devices and the role of quantum measurement. Um, we have been able to introduce con concepts like superposition and entanglement and explore, explore them from a phenomenological point of view using simulation in, uh, in the stern gerlach experiment or the Max and the interferometer and connect them um, to the key element um, that explain how uh, quantum technology work uh, inside a quantum algorithm. And this part has been explored using uh, the I IBM quantum composer. So um, uh, in this sense, uh, quantum technology become uh, as an, uh, seen as an opportunity uh, to study the interplay between physics, uh, logic, and computer science uh, in the making a new description of reality based on quantum theory. So this is an example of what we did with our students. Uh, for example, we analyzed the, pen, the quantum penny flip using a mathematical representation and equation and state vectors, as you can see on the top right. And also with the, the use of the IBM quantum composer. Um, this, um, the use of this formalism, the use of these kind of activities um, are an opportunity to generate a um, significant and not standard exercise to make students practice and reflect about quantum. The students discuss a lot about those algorithms, how these uh, quantum states change. And so in this context, maths is uh, a reasoning tool that can support students in the exploration of different concepts and idea in a natural interdisciplinary context. And they, we make them sweat, as you can see, we not just, we, the exercise were not trivial at all, but believe it or not, they enjoy it. Um, because they told us that um, now quantum looks more like the, the physics that they are used to study. So they can put their hands in a very polite way on physics and they can manipulate ideas and concepts using math as they are used to do in other uh, topics like mechanics or uh, they, they cover in the, in the school curriculum. And uh, being familiar with quantum circuits and being able to extract information from different representation using maths, for example, uh, made students able to tackle more complex circuits and application such as teleportation. Uh, these activities are meant not only to uh, apply what, what they've learned during the course, but also to reflect about the impact of quantum technology. So we all, that, uh, that uh, kind of, uh, of um, activities also promote discussion about the role of quantum technology, the possibilities they have. Um, finally, we have this uh, PCTO um, activity um, that is mandatory again uh, for uh, in Italian school. Um, 279 students participate in the activities, 16 who were involved um, um, all around Italy. Uh, we start with uh, lectures, about online lectures about uh, some of the uh, key in topics ideas of, of quantum um, using both simulations and uh, use, introducing the students to the use of the quantum composer. And then um, the students uh, had the opportunity to select um, six, uh, sorry, um, five workshops about quantum com com computing, quantum communication, and the, the foundation of um, quantum uh, technologies and quantum physics. 
this is it basically these are activities and i hope in the maybe in the discussion that will follow we have the opportunity to ask questions and in, interact again thank you very much for your attention Many thanks, Filippo, for uh, sharing with us uh, this great bridge between engaging students and letting them sweat uh, with joy afterwards. Uh, and um, I'm happy now to open the um, question and answer session, which will uh, regard these talks that we heard from uh, Marilu about the general challenges and outreach, from Zeki about the actions in the community, uh, the, in, in this direction, and from Filippo about the um, specific implementation of uh, engagement plus uh, um, deep dive uh, in, in a school um, about quantum revolution. So I would say that uh, we have both options. So please write in the chat your question or raise your hand uh, if you want. So we are 37, I think we can manage that. Uh, so that uh, then I, I invite you to, to, to ask the question and, and then the speaker will reply. So looking forward for your questions. So we did a perfect job and there are no questions. <laughs> exactly. So far, uh, we are at this point. Um, right. You see, it's, it's, it's a little bit complex system that we are in these platforms here and there and there are options. So uh, let us give a little bit of, uh, of brief. And uh, meantime, we are, we are waiting for questions. So I should be also very careful on uh, on having under control um, the right hands. Um, I would like to ask uh, Marilou um, maybe first about the challenges that, uh, that uh, she waved at the end of her talk and uh, explicitly um, the one regarding the, um, the <clears throat> quantum versus um, quality versus junk uh, situation that, that was raised up, which I think requires, uh, is, a, is a big opportunity on one side to profit, but also a big challenge to, 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 to channel it. So uh, maybe Marilu can comment on the yeah. approaches. Yeah, of course. Uh, <clears throat> oh, this is a very interesting question um, uh, because uh, uh, in fact, uh, we, we do have uh, the same problem also with everything that is not quantum, right? So often uh, there, there are misleading pieces of uh, science that run all over uh, the social media and, uh, and, uh, and the internet. So this is a general problem and how to face it. Uh, so uh, there is, uh, uh, in this for this kind of uh, very complex uh, problems uh, where you have real, really little control uh, about uh, um, making, uh, uh, I mean, about spotting uh, the, the junk, uh, so to speak, uh, the fake news, etc. Uh, I think that there are <clears throat> two uh, complementary approaches that should be taken and developed with uh, uh, with uh, appropriate uh, tools. And uh, one, of course, uh, there, mu there always must be something like a kind of a control that, uh, uh, that uh, should be, uh, uh, th 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 of course, it's not easy because uh, uh, <laughs> internet and social media are so, uh, so, so the information, they, they travel so fast and everywhere that is, uh, really um, not uh, easy but uh, some form of controls can be can be uh, used i think for example uh, the kind of control that is on wikipedia uh, also is a kind of control that involves many persons right everyone uh, does his own or her own job but the, the most powerful form that we have 
is uh, educating uh, a large uh, part of the population, at least to the, if not to the specific knowledge that is even, uh, that is maybe harder, at least uh, to the, uh, to the kind of scientific thinking, to the scientific thinking process. And so in that manner, it is possible to um, boost uh, that kind of critical thinking that uh, uh, in front of uh, a quantum junk, for example, if we are speaking about quantum junks, uh, maybe the person, the whoever person is not able to understand why uh, it is a junk, but can perceive that it is a junk, or at least uh, uh, pose, poses himself or herself the question uh, whether it is needed to, to go uh, deeper in detail, maybe has an idea of where to go and check and do some fact checking about what has heard and so on and so forth. And of course, uh, making this massive education also uh, enhances uh, uh, the possibility of control, because uh, if it is uh, a community control instead than uh, a single person control, the, the most persons educated we have, the better the process works. Many thanks, Marilu, for the insight into this uh, challenging point. I would like to ask our host, uh, Helen, if uh, she sees hands that are raised up because I'm not sure I have a full control over the, over the Zoom because I see no hands so far and uh, no questions either in the chat. So you did a really great job. Here, there is a hand. Is it a test or, um, ah, no, there is a hand from Ziad and uh, uh, please Ziad, unmute yourself and uh, we are looking forward for your question. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you all for the very interesting talk. Uh, I have a question, I guess, to all three participants. Um, um, the main issue we face when we give workshops is to find enough participants. And like once we get them into the room, engaging them and I kind of teaching them in an alternative way somehow works. But it's that first barrier to get someone to kind of attend the event. So I was wondering if you have any number, I mean, Filippo gave some numbers that were very high on how many students participated, but like, do you have networks with the schools around you or yeah, how do you get people to attend your different activities? Thank you, Ziata. But, um, um, so, so is Filippo answering first? I'd say that that will be a great point. Uh, yes, sorry, uh, <laughs> I was reading the question in the chat. So yeah, um, about the, the participation. Well, uh, if you are talking about students, uh, the students that we engage with, uh, basically the students are the teacher we work with during the professional development program. And so we have uh, the opportunity to interact with students through their teachers. Um, as you can see, uh, the, the students that participated in the uh, in the high, in the summer school uh, where I motivated students. So then most of them are looking for a career in engineering, physics, uh, whatever. So uh, very interested in the in, in the topic. Um, this is the, the part of the summer school. Um, talking about the PCTO, this huge program I, I show you, but this been a, been, a, been a big effort from different uh, location and universities in Italy um, to uh, collect um, students from their specific uh, areas. So we've been able to, to join and uh, to join together about 280 students because we ask uh, every uh, in every university in every university to ask the teaching work we to uh, in, to to, uh, to participate. And, and so that was the process. We, we, we just show, we, just, we start to reinforce the community and that's to, to, to create a network, to consolidate a network and that help us to, to reach the students. Um, those students, not all of them were highly motivated. Uh, some of them were forced by the fact that this, this PCTO is a mandatory activity. But we are indeed have been able to, uh, uh, to share uh, those ideas with them. And we and the participation, especially in the workshop, has been very good. In the sense that the, then the, 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 some of the kids really enjoy the, the activity, so uh, we reach some of the goals. 
and we also had some um, uh, more in-depth vision about how to the motivation is related to the participation in this most kind of activity so it's been a good uh, activity to do many thanks uh, for, for the answer there is one more question for you in the chat and uh, the one from diana has just come i said that we would take over these two questions in a while so filippo reads the question in the meantime i'd like to ask zeki to 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 tell about his uh, way of attracting students to the workshops yeah, thanks. So I shared the link for our uh, QBronze workshop list. Since now we organized more than 70 workshops in 26 countries and around 3000 uh, people completed these workshops. Uh, and during this time, one of the things that we mainly uh, recognized is that it, it is important to have a high quality content, but reach is also very important as because we assume that people will automatically uh, know that there is a workshop going on, but they don't. And it, it's just posting it on your social media accounts doesn't count. Like, let's say you have 5000 followers and you post an uh, post. Uh, on your account, only a very small minority of them will encounter this post and maybe they are busy, maybe they are doing something else while looking at your post. So a very small number of people will actually be aware that your event is going on. So you need, you really need a strong uh, reach uh, networks. Uh, I think the QT Edu uh, repositories are a good way uh, for that, but uh, we really need some uh, ways to make people know that there are events going on, there are workshops going on. These workshops are usually free. Uh, they are for all different uh, levels of uh, background knowledge. Uh, and uh, especially for uh, smaller countries. I think it is really hard to get huge numbers of uh, participants for these workshops. Many thanks, Jack. Uh, I think this is, uh, will re 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 reappear this discussion in the end of the community discussion, but another workshop because it's really a, an important point and it networks related. Um, uh, so uh, I would say that now we 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 reply the question of Siang uh, Courtney uh, to Filippo, and uh, he said that uh, Sian says that in Ireland high school students do not cover matrices in their mathematics courses, and uh, he asks, have you thought of ways to do uh, satisfying calculations without using them? Okay. Filippo. Super question. <laughs> no answer available. Okay. Oh, yes, we try. And this is both part of the discussion of the teacher. So because even if they are, they are supposed to teach factors and matrices, not, they don't like to do it. And so um, some of the teachers we work with, uh, we use the, um, some of the ideas we provide them in the, in the, in the program um, in, inside, their, inside their lessons. The main idea is this, the, um, uh, use matrices because you want to see how the state is changing uh, when interact with the device inside um, a standard apparatus or inside a max and interferometer. So you can, you can represent the state as a vector and the polar, polarizer, for example, which is the matrices. But the, the main idea is that all the information you have of, of a state is modified through the apparatus or inside the, the circuit. And that is the main idea. And then if you, if you want to go in deep in the, 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 the mathematical details, you can do it. But this is the idea that the result has very useful for the teachers to, to convey. The idea is that you have some information about the, the state. Uh, and so and not about the object itself, not about these properties, but about the state. And the properties of the object are, are what are, are the result of a measurement. And so if you are, and they, well, they, even if they don't didn't use the, these matrices and vectors, they try to drive this idea at the state of a state that, uh, that evolve and then can be measured. And for example, in the activity of the, uh, of the for example, uh, about polarization, 
and uh, some of the teachers decide to use matrices, some others not. Uh, but for example, they use a lot of the, 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 the simulations, the QVs simulation, that in the end, that would be very, very helpful and uh, to try those, uh, those ideas. So yes, we can avoid using mathematics if you don't want to, but the, is the structure uh, the, the, uh, of the, what's happening to a, to a qubit that is important. It's still the result of the interaction with teachers. Many thanks, Filippo. I think uh, you and Sian may even have a great discussion uh, behind the scene uh, on this on this aspect. And uh, reading the questions of the, uh, the Daria, thank you, Daria, um, uh, which is a very very uh, interesting one. Uh, this asks: Do you think that in the end of the day, outreach can make a big difference, or is it the change of the curricula in the school and high school? Um, which will actually do a change in uh, uh, education, pe educating people with basic knowledge. So this is the, I think we take this question and we will start our community discussion really from that one because it's great and uh, uh, we, we, we keep it in mind uh, for our community discussion. Now, I think very much our first uh, panel of talks, and uh, uh, I suggest we have um, uh, we have a, a very, very short break now because we are running off time greatly, but just that you can grab a glass of water or um, a coffee uh, in, in, uh, in a couple of minutes. So please uh, have a couple of minutes time and then we um, come back on air. Yeah, let's say 11.50, okay? 11.15. Yeah. Hmm. Let me do it directly. Okay, it's 11.50. Welcome back everyone to the second part of our session. Oksana, could you stop sharing your screen? Thank you. So welcome back to the second part of our session, which is a long session, uh, but I find it super interesting what we've heard up to now and there's more to come, so stay tuned. The second part of the session is on education and we will first hear an invited talk on the present state to summarizing uh, the, the, the state we are now in, in quantum technologies in, in high school and giving us an outlook on what, what is to come. And then we have five presentations on the results of the QT Edu pilots on high school. It's amazing that there are five pilots on high school. And in the end, we have a contributed talk and a community discussion. So let us not lose time. We start with the invited talk on quantum physics in secondary education. Where do we stand? It's by Kim Greitenberg from the Freudenthal Institute from the Utrecht University in the Netherlands. And we have deliberately not chosen an aged person who looks back at 20 years of experience, but a young researcher who will give us a fresh look at this emerging topic in high schools. Kim, the stage is yours. Thank you. Um, I will share my screen. Um, I hope you see it now. I don't yes. Hear it. Okay. Well, um, well, you asked me to tell something about uh, the current state of quantum uh, physics in secondary education, and uh, I really like to talk about it. And uh, well, um, I'm going to tell something about what has happened for the last five years or so. Uh, you introduced me very well, so I can skip this one, um, and I'm going to this one. Uh, what will I talk about today? I'm going to start with my review study. I uh, did a review study in 2016, it was published in 2017. And in this study, I looked at the, the state of quantum education at that moment and uh, research into that. And I also saw that there were cer certain themes that were coming up in all the uh, articles that was uh, teaching strategies, learning difficulties, multimedia and assessment tools. And I'm going to look, uh, after that, that I looked at the review study, I'm going to look at those themes for the last five years. So, and I will end with 
future challenges. Well, first my review study, um, you might have read it. Um, and as I said, it focuses on these four teams. And when I look at these, um, uh, these teams, there were a certain uh, conclusions and also um, ideas of how to go on. Uh, the first one for students' difficulties, we saw mix-ups, we saw overgeneralizations, we saw that students uh, didn't know how to handle the combination of classical and uh, uh, quantum mechanics. And uh, there was more ne research needed. That was clear, and especially for uh, the potential wells or more complex uh, co topics of quantum mechanics, such as uh, superposition and things like that. Uh, when I looked at multimedia, those uh, applications mainly focused at, at uh, university um, students. And um, yeah, that was, um, it, it, it was maybe useful for secondary school, but also there was more empirical research needed to see if it will work at secondary level. Looking at teaching strategies, um, there we saw that there were some ideas that were uh, analyzed and evaluated, mainly a uh, focus on interpretation, focus on models in uh, secondary school uh, classes. And you saw that that worked, that it led to good understanding, but there are other approaches and in different curricula, there are different ways to implement quantum mechanics. So there is more empirical research needs. And th that's what I stated back then. And finally, um, an important one, assessment tools. We also saw there that um, this was mainly focusing on university students. And we also saw that uh, there was a really a need for more topics uh, that were covered in uh, is such an assessment tool. So that was the state in 2017. And what did I do? I just did the same search again, and I looked at the period of time between 2017 and right now. And I looked at um, uh, those, um, those same themes. And I must say it was it's a quick span, a quick scan. It's not a complete review study again. Uh, I looked at it, I looked at highlights and what I saw was about 50 articles on students' understanding. There were articles 27 on teaching strategies and nine on assessment tools and 15 on multimedia. And I must, I, I'm sure that this is not complete, but this was what's coming from my, um, from my search. So now we're going to talk about these themes and I'm going to start with teaching strategies. And uh, before I do that, it's good to first look at the work of Kirsten Stademan. She looked at different um, curricula that are uh, internationally done of quantum mechanics in, in secondary schools. And what she saw was that there was some sort of core quantum curriculum that was done everywhere. There were certain topics that were done in specific countries. And you see here on the right that in Scotland, you have more focus on the wave function, whereas in Italy and Norway, you have more um, emphasis on philosophical aspects. And that also makes clear that there was a large body of research into um, with particle duality and light and matter, things like that. Those are part of the core curriculum and philosoph philosophical consequences, tunneling, uh, wave functions, those things are a little bit less, a little less research. Well, um, in the last five years, we saw that there were, uh, was research in specific topics. And I just took, uh, a few that, that stood out, I, I, I took them. And the first one is the focus on nature of science and history and philosophy of science. When you look there, uh, there was one interesting study also of Kirsten Stademan uh, that stated that if you give quantum mechanics in secondary schools, that this will lead to uh, enhance students' understanding of nature of science, even if you do not um, specifically address it. Um, there was also an interesting or more studies about uh, Relic Reliquant. Uh, that's a, 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 a teaching um, website with all kinds of um, things for students to do. Uh, and it's 
innovative. It focuses on uh, discussion, it focuses on writing and really thinking things through and on uh, philosophy, what's going on, what does this mean, interpretation. And you saw there that uh, they concluded that it is a good way to approach it, but students have not yet learned to work in that way. So there is a need for better alignment in that. When I look at uh, another topic that came out was quantum optics. Uh, the first study that I show here is uh, one uh, that, that is a design. It's not implemented, but it gives an idea of what you can do with uh, single photon experiments. And in the second study that's here, presented here, that's from uh, Philip Bittenbauer. He's working with uh, photon experiments. And what he saw in his study was that uh, students were uh, able to let go of deterministic thinking more than in the normal uh, quantum mechanics program at secondary schools. So there's work done in that part. When we look at the following, uh, this was already there in 2017. But there, are, there are things that have happened. Uh, the multiple path approach, you see uh, first the Italian uh, group that's working on it. And uh, they have looked at it, have used it, and looked at the mental models of students. And they concluded that students have more consistent metal, mental models of, uh, the, uh, of, of electrons and photons. So it gives a more steady uh, way of describing those uh, quantum concepts. And there was also a study, it's not from Europe, but uh, from Australia, but I think it's really interesting where they try to uh, put the multiple path approach at lower secondary levels and they use phaser wheels, wheels with uh, a circle that with a with narrow that goes round and they use that Feynman method, but more practical. They have used it within a, within a larger program and they looked at real life analogies and things to uh, make it tangible. The last one I want to talk about is the potential well, um, because that's something that I stated in my um, first review that that's something there's also a need for research into. Uh, I saw one uh, design uh, study for ideas to relate the potential well to uh, semiconductors and to more uh, uh, cutting edge uh, technologies and things that are more related to technology. Uh, I also did a study myself into potential energy, energy diagrams to make the connection between classical and quantum physics. And in that you saw that uh, there was an improved understanding. So these are four topics that, um, that came up when I uh, scanned through all the articles. Um, there's a lot happening also um, if you look at uh, writing to learn, inquiry-based learning, things like that. There, there are all people who are working on, on topics uh, to increase uh, students' understanding of quantum and mechanics. Um, the next part that I want to talk about is uh, learning difficulties. And um, I want to first start with uh, uh, reflecting on one study of Tim Boucher. Uh, he did a, a review and looked at all the difficulties that students, uh, secondary school students have while learning quantum mechanics. And if you look at this, and um, if you may have read my review, this is somewhat the same. You see here the same learning difficulties. So students have difficulty with uh, relating the mathematical formalism to reality, to what they see around them. People, uh, students think it's counterintuitive. They have difficulty with the, de the non-deterministic nature of quantum mechanics. And you also see that language is important because uh, students uh, link words to certain specific prior knowledge. And those things were also in the last four years uh, came up more often. Uh, I also in my um, recommendation said there should be more uh, knowledge on learning difficulties uh, regarding wave functions and more complex quantum concepts. And uh, if you look at wave function and potential wells, uh, there was a study um, into students' difficulties and it showed that students had mix-ups, uh, that they overgeneralized prior knowledge and they also missed some knowledge. When you look at the more uh, complex or uh, 
more difficult quantum concepts. Uh, when I look from my perspective of our students, we saw that there were um, research into spin first and uh, said that spin first was something that could make it easier for students because the mathematics is less difficult. They, um, there was research into um, two state systems, into indeterminism and uh, superposition. And what you saw in one study, um, I named it before, was that students had less difficulty with the non-deterministic way of quantum mechanics uh, when you use that approach. So this is something I think uh, we should take into account. Um, another thing that, yeah, I have it here. Um, another thing that um, I thought was really interesting was that there are also articles that did not focus on what the misunderstandings were, but more on what is going good and what do we want students to learn? There was one uh, study uh, I think from Italy, if I look at the names, and it was focusing on a construct map about what should students learn and what kind of level of understanding do we want. They already, uh, they also tested it with, with a test. And we saw a study that was quite recent of uh, the group of uh, Norway that was looking at how do students describe quantum uh, phenomena and what teams come up what levels of explanations do they have? Is it more mathematical? Is it more uh, experimental? Things like that. Um, I also looked at multimedia. I'm not really into the multimedia, so I just uh, looked at what, what I found. And uh, most of you will know the, the work of Quantum Composer and QPlay Learn. Uh, Quantum Composer is focusing on more on, on higher level education, but also has some work done for uh, um, more advanced high school students. And when I look at it, I think there should be a possibility to relate it also to normal high school students, but that's still something that needs to be found out. Um, the T and Delta um, article is more on the requirements of games and gives an example of quantum mechanics. QPlay Learn is focusing on more outreach, but I thought it they were really uh, focusing on imagination, intuition. So that's really interesting. And they also wanted to be correct. And the last one, the double well, it's maybe not completely new, but the focus was more on non-determinism, on superposition, the role of measurement. So, and it was done at the secondary level. So that's also an interesting study when you want to know more about multimedia. One minute. Yes. Um, the last one, assessment tools. Uh, there was a research ladder uh, that was mainly focusing on uh, university level. And we also saw uh, two studies I saw uh, focusing on, um, uh, the first one was focusing on the hypothetical learning progression of students and um, was looking at wave behavior, measurement, atoms and electrons. And one uh, that was focusing on uh, photons, experimental and theoretical aspects thereof. And the beautiful thing of the last one is that it was focusing on uh, secondary school, but I also think that the, the second one in the middle is also really uh, appropriate for secondary school students. Um, now, shortly, what are our challenges? When I look at this, um, if we want a curriculum that focuses on quantum technology, quantum education, I think it is important uh, to do first the, the background, the, the, the underlying things. And one important question that we should ask ourselves is how do we relate it to quantum technologies? And we've seen a few things here, something about semiconductor quantum wells, quantum states, single photon experiments. This is something we need to think about. And if we look at um, the implementation, we really should work for an assessment tool for teaching strategies, teaching tra teacher training. So there we have to work. And the beautiful thing is, and here I'm going to end, um, the open school pilots that are uh, presented next are all focusing on those topics. So I think that we are uh, at the start of something beautiful. Thank you. Thank us, thanks a lot, Kim, for this inspiring talk, the start of something beautiful. That's a great motto for this whole 
endeavor. Um, and you've introduced the, the, the pilots now. Um, now come the pilot presentations. Um, we have five QT Edo pilots. The first one is uh, chaired by Philip Bitzenbauer and you together. Um, it's uh, on a um, development of a quantum concept inventory. And I'm handing over to Philip. Yeah, thank you very much. I would like to share my screen first. So hope that works. Can you all see the slides? Rainer, do you see the slides? Yes. 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 Yeah, perfect. Okay. Yeah, so thank you very much. And I'm very happy to, to present to you the first pilot on, 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 on schools. So with the title Community-Based Development of the Quantum Concept Inventory. And in this talk, I would like to talk about objectives that we aim for with this pilot and also on the current status of the project. Um, I mean, as, as Kim has very beautifully presented in her talk previously, um, during the last um, decades, but also during the last five years, there have been tremendous efforts towards the development of teaching approaches for secondary school teaching of quantum. Um, and uh, the most important aspects that we have seen in her talk is that there are different contexts that are used, right? So some of the researchers, they propose historical paths, others use experiment-based approaches, there are ex uh, teaching approaches on two-state systems and other on rather conceptual issues. And um, for me, as I'm a physics education researcher, the most interesting thing about all this stuff is um, the, the impact of the, of the different teaching approaches on the students' understanding. I mean, uh, we have to evaluate that students' understanding and different approaches in order to improve the teaching concepts in particular, of course, so that we have to can optimize and refine the approaches that we developed on the one hand based on empirical results. But in more general, we also need the evaluation of the given topic. Uh, approaches in order to, you know, improve teaching of quantum physics at secondary school level in more general. And this, of course, requires research tools, requires evaluation is in instruments. And as Kim previously stated, um, we observe a lack of such research tools for the secondary school level, but there is a lot of um, research tools for the undergraduate level. So this is where our project starts, and I would like to focus on one part of the title of our pilot in particular. Um, you see here the term community basement, and um, in yeah, concretely, this means that we aim for providing the whole community with a broadly usable instrument, a quantum concept inventory, so to say, um, which enables the investigation of secondary school students' conceptual knowledge on a very broad range of quantum concepts. So. Um, yeah, to be honest, to bring and you know, to, to achieve that goal, we, it, yeah, for us, it was important to bring together as many as uh, perspectives as possible. And this, this means the pilot were the perfect stage for that. Um, so we wanted a community based development of such an inventory and this plays a major role in our pilot project. This is coordinated by me and Kim. And we are working together with 22 researchers from nine countries. And to start off, um, we had a kickoff event back in July uh, 2021, where we got to know each other and we talked about our own experiences um, on the one hand with our current research, but also with empirical research in general. And we decided to form two groups. And you can see as we have um, participants, over 20 participants from new, nine European countries, that enables us to have a very broad perspective on the development of such a convent, uh, concept inventory. Our major goal is the development of a concept inventory on quantum physics. I already said that. But the novelty is that we aim for a development that is context independent. What does that mean? As I talked about the previous, the, uh, about the different teaching approaches, and I stated that there are different, you know, thematic foci, and we want to provide um, the the community with an instrument that can be used for different approaches yeah and therefore we decided to develop the concept inventory in a modular form what does that mean okay that means that for given concepts that we want to include in our inventory let me say for example superposition there are many items on that topic and depending on the researcher's need one can use maybe the items on superposition and maybe the items on another concept uh, content item and then form a booklet a test booklet from that way that it allows the reliable and valid measurement of students' conceptual knowledge. And maybe another researcher has another, another requirement and uses different um, sub-tests, so, so to say. So as a preview, one can say that this 
um, this project should add value to all upcoming initiatives because we want to form yeah, somehow a empirical basis for all projects whenever it comes to the teaching and learning of quantum physics and its evaluation at the secondary school level. To do so, we decided on a, on a study design and you can see on the left hand side what we have planned for the first year, so for the pilot phase, and we already have ideas for a follow up project, um, so to say, for, for the time beyond the pilots. A very important aspect for the development of such an inventory, of course, is the identification of key concepts of quantum physics that are relevant to secondary school learning. Um, and therefore, we relied on expert points of view, but not only um, with, um, with, yeah, with respect to current school curricula, but also with uh, future perspectives. So we do not want to uh, develop a test instrument that is only suitable today and what, uh, for what students learn today, but also with what we want them to learn in the future. Um, therefore, we yeah, wanted to identify these concepts. I will talk about that later. And based on that, we will have to select appropriate test items and lastly, qualitatively evaluate them in order to you know, refine generated items, for example, via think aloud studies. Um, maybe the most important step I also already mentioned that is the, the, is the identification of concepts that have to be included in such a test. And um, to, 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 to show that to you in a bit more detail, um, I will talk about the Delphi study that we conducted. Um, the Delphi study is a, is a, is a form, a method to evaluate expert opinions. And what we did is we asked experts from the community what should be in secondary school curricula. And um, in the next round, which we will, which we'll do in the, in the future, we will ask experts now to, to rate and rank the, the concepts that we have found from our first round. Our first Delphi round um, has been distributed among the Qubit QT Edu community, and we have used a questionnaire with two parts. In the first part, we asked like open questions into why quantum mechanics should be in curricula of the future and what content items. And in the second, more closed um, uh, version, we asked for concrete content items with a strong reference to the competence framework. We um, received responses from 68 experts from 14 countries, which enables us to give a very broad perspective. And you can see that a third of the people were physics education researchers. Approximately another third was a physics educator at university level. And we also had a third of the people being physics teacher at high school. So a very broad perspective on the same topic. In the first part, we asked on um, why uh, secondary school students should learn quantum mechanics to make an open introductory question. And then reflecting the content items that should be addressed in curricula of the future to address these reasons that have been stated. And this is interesting because you can see that the most important aspects for the participants was the aspect of technology. So secondary school students should learn quantum mechanics because of its importance for future technologies. And um, this also is reflected by the question on which content content items should be in curricula because there you find uh, items such as measurement, superposition, and also entanglement. And this is interesting because um, in current curricula, entanglement only plays a very minor role, if any, in school curricula. So, so you see perspective for, uh, of experts is quite different from what is the current state of the art in quantum physics teaching at secondary level. And uh, to be a bit more uh, concrete, we uh, refer to the competence framework, um, which has been developed during the QT Edu project. And we wanted to know as to which of the aspects that have been um, found in there to be important for workforce, which of these aspects would also be important for secondary school uh, teaching, you know, to maybe get somehow a, a smaller version of the competence framework suitable for secondary school teaching. And therefore we asked the experts view on the key concepts of quantum physics that should be in there with reference to the first part of the um, competence framework. Secondly, regarding the key foundations for quantum technologies. And lastly, regarding key aspects of quantum technologies. And um, just let me give you a short impression of the results on the first and last um, section. So regarding which key concepts of quantum physics should be in there, we found, of course, the um, one stated before, for example, interference, superposition, measurement, entanglement. And this reflects the first and the last part of the competence framework in this respect. Um, but the only one I'm missing here is mathematical formalism. And I think that makes sense from a um, high school point of view. 
And if you think about the key aspects of quantum technologies, then one can state that from an expert point of view, the most interesting and um, important thing for secondary school teaching indeed is quantum computing, um, considering quantum gates and quantum algorithms, but also quantum cryptography and communication. So from this perspective, we will now go on with uh, development of the con quantum concept inventory. So we have to um, define the, the concrete concepts that we want to take into account from the second day every round. We are working on that at the moment and we will distribute that before Christmas, I hope. So I, will, I hope you all will participate then and to give us your feedback. And uh, then the last uh, task, of course, is the development of the con quantum concept inventory. And we have already started in one of our work groups um, of, uh, with the collection of existing items. So to see what is already there. And from that Miro uh, categorization, you can see that there is a lot of items as, as, as Kim has already stated on phenomena and also on math, which is all on the undergraduate level, but there's very, very, very minor uh, items existing on applications and technology. So we have to put uh, an effort into the development of further items in the future to then select the appropriate ones qualitatively evaluate them and then serve, uh, provide you with a beta version of the quantum concept inventory by the end of the pilot year. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks a lot, Philip. And please collect your questions for the Q&A session at the yes. end. Sure. Um, then we have a little problem because our next speaker uh, hasn't turned up, uh, Hank is not here. I've written him an email some a while ago, but he hasn't replied. I don't know what has happened. So I would propose to go on with Geisha. Geisha, are you ready? Uh, and then... I'm ready. Many thanks. Yeah, and then look whether hand will appear. appear and uh, now uh, I would like to introduce Geisha Pospisch from uh, Technische Universität Dresden. And they are uh, here. She's heading a pilot on um, developing uh, concepts for a um, two state approach to quantum physics. Gisha. Okay. Many thanks for your in introduction. It's the school pilot on development of quantum concepts via different two state approaches. And this pilot addresses some of the points that have already been mentioned. It's uh, what um, Marie-Lou said about the micro and macro theory and the uh, intertwining of basic concepts of quantum, uh, quantum physics and quantum technology. It's a measurement of the effects of tools and also that we really need research on the uh, different existing teaching approaches that we have and which we perhaps want to evaluate concerning the effectiveness in teaching uh, and learning different quantum concepts. Uh, so I first want to introduce the partners. It's, uh, as you see, more or less six partners from four countries. And you see also the intertwining between the, different pilots so that there can be a synergy also uh, between pilots perhaps in the next phase. Uh, what are we doing? Uh, the partners we have uh, gathered in this uh, pilot uh, have developed different approaches concerning two state systems. So we all uh, teach quantum physics on the basis of two state systems, but with different systems such as double well or the polarization, also the polarization as model for the spin. And even the three polarization models, you see it's polarization with hands-on experiments leading to basic quantum concepts. It's a focus on single photons. You see the reference here. And it's the intertwining of basic quantum concepts such as superposition, measuring process, and uncertainty uh, with aspects of quantum technology such as quantum cryptography. And the goal is the motivation of the pilot is to, of course, to enhance teaching, learning, and deeper understanding of quantum physics in general with a focus on the basic quantum concepts and to promote also the understanding of quantum technology on a solid basis, on a solid understanding of the basic 
concepts. And the uh, conjecture where we start from is that each approach via two state systems has specific advantages for teaching and learning the content concepts. And we wanted to know uh, which approach is perhaps uh, best suited of, uh, for one or the other approach. And therefore the intention is to compare the effects of the different approaches and to develop test instruments for um, detecting these effects. Of course, this is a long-term procedure. And as you see from this, we also uh, develop kind of a quantum concept inventory, which is flexible. There you see the synergy with the previous pilot. The working plan as it was proposed uh, or asked for in the QTE do is an uh, inspiration synergy implementation and ev evaluation phase. And you see the blank carrots uh, down there that are there. I will describe the activities of our pilot. So the first step was to collect and to compare the different state approaches we have. For this, we used such as um, um, Philip showed a mirror board where we had different uh, teaching approach uh, proposals in a standardized short form, though it was easy to compare the main effects, what are the main approaches, the main contents. Here you see the content. Uh, the topic, the content, how it's treated, and the teaching material. And, and this standardized form gave a good overview over these teaching proposals. Starting from this, uh, collecting and discussing the teaching proposals, we had this, the sharpening phase, phase where we defined our goals, really try to identify which of the two state contexts is most suitable suitable for teaching which quantum physics concept, which is really, um, of course, perhaps, uh, we do not expect that one um, approach is the best over all aspects, but that every uh, approach has its own advantages and we try to use the most uh, suitable for each concept. And therefore, uh, from this we started and we wanted also to know what do students learn? How do they think? And the next uh, phase is then the synergy and really um, discussing the relevant concepts, the focus on the key. And then we agreed that in this short pilot phase, we should focus on one key, on one key concept and we choose the measuring process as being at the heart of uh, quantum and classic uh, on the heart of difference of quantum and classical physics and we started to develop a questionnaire concerning the measurement process. So we, I can skip this, so the research question was then which characteristics of the quantum measuring process are learned in which approach and how do the students understand the measuring process in the different approaches. And uh, the first thing was the goal to develop a questionnaire with some closed and open items. And the closed items uh, are at least at the moment designed in a way that the students should um, explain their choice. Then the target group, we agreed that it should be in the end high school students, but uh, the piloting we will do from practical reasons with teacher students and some high school high school students and in the um, implementation phase, we will try to do school trials with this questionnaire. So the develop of the questionnaire was such that we um, agreed on a procedure, we collected items, we took also the mirror board Philip just showed, we identified and graded items and we reformulated them and now we have a we had the first pre-pilot of the questionnaire where we saw if it's working at all, how long does it take and, and so on. And now we are in a state that the questionnaires are translated into the mother language. If you see uh, it was developed in English and none of the partners has English as, as mother language. So we have there also uh, some um, additional problems, tasks to solve. And we will apply this questionnaire in a pilot phase and see how the questionnaire has to be reworked. 
The implementation, it's the outlook, it's we will uh, pilot the questionnaire, rework it, and then we will apply it in school trials during next year. And this, this will um, partly be uh, supported by teacher formation so that the uh, teacher formation know what to do. We really have to, uh, I, yeah. Um, we agreed on a fixed length of the Im implementation so that uh, independent of, of the um, context and approach, the number of lessons taught to the high school students will be the same, though so that we have at least a uh, kind of uh, possibility of comparison. So the next will be the conclusions we will have in the evaluation and the impact for the community will really be to have a questionnaire on, on the measuring process. Uh, this could be a part of this modular quantum concept inventory Philip mentioned before, and that we will get some in, insight into the teaching and learning differences of different approaches, where it is to say it's all two state system approaches. And we will see how this questionnaire will be extended and uh, contribute to the quantum concept inventory. Many thanks for your attention. Thanks a lot, Kese. Um, and now I see Hank has joined us, uh, but we will give him a few minutes to breathe through and proceed with the uh, pilot presentation by Erika and uh, Erika Andreotte and Lisa Bracken. And um, then I have the presentation of Hank, right? Uh, then we go to um, the pilot on quantum technology PCK for teachers by Erika and Lisa. Yeah. So can you see the screen? Yes, I, I think so. See. Yes. Okay. Thank you. So I am Erika and uh, my colleague Lise. So we are from uh, University College Slovel Nimburg in Belgium. And uh, we will present this pilot on the quantum technology PCK for teachers. Uh, as UCL is the coordinator of the pilot, but of course we have other consortium members that we present as well. Um, so first I will start from what is the main goal of our pilot. Uh, the idea is that uh, we want to create a synoptic uh, pedagogical content knowledge map, uh, which should be of practical use for uh, secondary school teachers, but also for teacher educators. Um, so the idea is that we will start to um, create this, to develop this tool um, based on the expertise which is um, available within the, our consortium. Uh, that means that this will not be uh, a final map, uh, including all the currently available knowledge on uh, PCK uh, for quantum uh, physics, of course, uh, but uh, it, will, it will be a starting point for further, further research later on. Um, we, our map uh, will include uh, mainly the core ideas, um, uh, on uh, of quantum mechanics and quantum technology and uh, some examples of methods how to teach it in uh, secondary schools from the approaches which are available within our consortium mainly um, and so it will be open to for further development later on uh, we want to include illustrations also uh, collected during our uh, the, pil the pilot itself um, so this is the main the main goal, uh, and the idea is that the ma the, this map will be uh, really uh, a tool that teachers uh, can can use and can inspire teachers when developing their lessons on uh, quantum physics and quantum technologies um, into their classrooms. But it will also help uh, teacher educators in um, uh, understanding how. Uh, they can bring this, they can transmit their, this, uh, the needed PCK uh, to their teacher students. Um, we'll go on. Okay, so this is uh, briefly about the consortium. 
Um, so we are from UCLL and we have some um, previous exper experience uh, with a European project, which is Quantum Spin-Off. So if you are interested, maybe you can have a look later on. Um, in this project, we brought uh, students, secondary st school students in contact with uh, uh, real researchers in um, quantum technologies. Um, we also developed uh, some learning materials using making use of analogies. Um, and we are using these learning materials also with our own uh, pre-service teacher, uh, physics teachers, uh, when teaching to them uh, quantum physics uh, and those quantum technologies. And then we have um, Utrecht University and University of Twente in, uh, in the Netherlands. Um, they are also teacher educators, so they work with uh, pre-service teachers, but also um, somehow with in-service teachers, so they have experience in research in didactics um, of uh, quantum physics in secondary schools. Um, and then we have two institutions in Italy, um, University of Insubria and University of Pavia. Um, so some of these people you met already in the previous uh, uh, presentations. Um, uh, this uh, University of Insubria, they have more uh, experience with in-service teachers in, by making training courses for them, but also with, um, uh, for, with courses for secondary school students. Uh, in the University of Pavia, also they, um, they work more with um, in-service teachers and they use different approaches so, uh, to, to teach quantum uh, physics. So these different approaches are very interesting for our, uh, for our map, of course. And then we have uh, University of Ljubljana. Um, the, Leon is also uh, a teacher himself. Um, so this is also interesting. Um, he uh, is a teacher trainer, but uh, also a teacher himself. Uh, and he works mainly with this two-state system approach. And now uh, we go to, to the approach of our, of our pilot. Um, so the idea, what we started already to do was uh, to uh, let all uh, the single uh, consor consortium member to develop their own local PCK map. Um, and uh, the idea is that, uh, so everybody is developing this uh, based on their own experiences, their own learning materials, their own approach. And then we are now in a phase in which we try to merge uh, these different local maps into a common map. And uh, in the meantime, we are also, some of us also starting a pilot in which we, we pilot our own approaches so that we can collect information uh, that can support then the development of, of this map. There can be uh, illustration of the different methods and approaches that we come in our map. Um, so we will have some results on how these made different methods are working. And um, some of, uh, of uh, us are already piloting now, some will pilot later on. Um, and then we will come to a final version of this map. And we think, we are thinking that it will, will be in the form of Prezi in which uh, teachers and, or teacher educators can click on, for example, one concept of quantum physics and then go to the sub-concept and there see uh, different possible illustration on methods uh, or approaches in which um, uh, we can be used uh, to teach them uh, with some um, suggestions uh, or, or some uh, pros and cons uh, and so on. So now I will give the word to Lise that will uh, explain the current status of the concept maps. Yeah, thank you, Erika. Uh, let's now have a closer look to the local concept maps, which were developed by each of the partners. So at the left, it's a version of the Netherlands, in the middle, the one from Italy, and at the right, um, our Belgian map. So you can see that we have a different focus. Our Dutch colleagues, they focus on how to teach the um, quantum technology PCK to pre-service teachers. So their main concepts are basically knowledge, competencies and attitudes. And on the other hand, Italy and Belgium, 
we focused on how to teach this quantum technology to secondary school students. So we started from um, our concepts are really quantum concepts and we work um, towards illustration of class activities. Okay, so um, as a next step, we made a second version of uh, local concept maps. So we try to merge the Italian and the Dutch um, um, version into one map and on the right side, the Belgian and the Netherlands. So for this, we use the same structure. Uh, why, how and what? So why it's important to teach quantum technology? Then how you teach it? Which pedagogical choices do you make? And what do you want to teach? So now in the next slide, I would like to discuss in more detail the Belgian and the Dutch map. So at the left, you can see the why part. We have three um, main um, topics, insight in technology, cultural reasons and institutional reasons. Um, so, for instance, uh, how quantum mechanics is related to everyday life, it can give insight in nature of science. So that's why you want to teach it. And then in the middle, you can see the part how you will teach it. So we can uh, consider the knowledge. For this, it's, for instance, students' prior knowledge, but also subject matter knowledge. And mm -hmm. together with the competences, you uh, um, can choose an approach. So as you can see, we have different approaches. For instance, analogy is the approach we use, analogy with the classical physics, but there is also the two-stated two approach and the historical approach. And you can see that we gave the edge a, a special color. And then uh, at the end, you can define a didactical strategy with different methods. So here below, you can see different methods such as simulations or hands-on experiments. And for that, we also defined a special color. So if we go to the right side, the what part, I took one example out of it. For instance, the main concept particle wave duality. It's connected to the sub-concept particle as a wave packet. And for that, we show one illustration of learning activities for instance, the analogy with classical waves, you can show some simulations how to build a wave packet using programs like iMusica. So you can see that the edge is orange. It means that approach is analogy. And inside it's the green color. So the method that was used was a simulation. Okay, and then uh, finally, we have to merge these two maps into one common uh, synoptic map. For that, we want to use this structure, why, how, and what. So the why part is mainly done. And uh, now we have um, next work to do on the how and the what part. Okay, so finally, just a um, few words about our research uh, methods, uh, because of course the main output is this, uh, synoptic map, uh, but during uh, the pilot, we also want uh, to make some quali qualitative research. And the research question is uh, to, what, to what extent we are successful in uh, transmitting the knowledge, but also the PCK uh, to our participants. And um, so the idea is that the results that we will collect uh, will be included in the map. Um, so the pilot, uh, the way in which we are doing the pilot, it depends on the partner. Uh, for example, uh, in the Netherlands, in Belgium, we are piloting with our own pre-service teacher students, while in Italy and in Slovenia, they are piloting with uh, in-service teachers. And the collection of data uh, is done uh, through different approaches. Uh, we have one common research method. We use a semi-structured focus group. You see uh, some example of questions, and uh, this is uh, done before and after the pilot. Uh, there are questions on the knowledge, and uh, there are questions on, about the pedagogy of quantum. Um, and under other, yeah, we also um, have 
the possibility to choose uh, a, another research method, which is which or each partner can choose, uh, like for example, observations of the participants, or let participants prepare their own concept maps uh, or other methods, and all these uh, results will in the end will be uh, used as illustrations on the on our final PCK map. So this was our presentation. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Erika and Lise. And now we will uh, with, come back to Hank's talk, uh, who will present the QTMAS pilot, Quantum Teaching Materials for High School. Hank is from uh, the Department of Physics at the Leiden University in the Netherlands. So now, Hank. Hank, are you hearing me? He's not there, it seems. Then maybe we take first um, the presentation by Ulrich, Ulrich Baskov from the Technische Universität of uh, Denmark. Um, Playful hands on quantum early education. Um, and Ulrich, that is yours. Thank you very much. I will just share my screen. Right. I hope you see it now. All right, so uh, good afternoon and thank you very much for this uh, opportunity to uh, tell you a bit about our, our little pilot called Funky, which is our short for Playful Hands-On Quantum Early Education. That is a school pilot and I will tell you a bit more about what, what this is what it's all about. So um, the, the pilot sort of in short is, uh, is described here. So what is it we want to do? In our pilot, we want to explore novel didactical approaches to teaching of uh, quantum physics. Uh, and in particular, we want to spur curiosity about quantum phenomena, and we want to stimulate creativity in high school education. Um, our motivation for doing this, our why, is um, so we want to facilitate deep learning, and we believe that you need curiosity and creativity to be present in the in the teaching situation or to to get deep learning and we would also like to create a very cheerful learning environment because it's well known that if you are enjoying yourself if you're in a in a good environment um, then you also learn in a more efficient way and you also help uh, knowledge retention or stimulate knowledge retention um, the, the way we want to do this is by, as I said, using uh, some uh, experimental uh, techniques. And what we want, in particular, we want to do, we want to merge humor as a, um, as a what we say, a serious uh, learning tool. I mean, many people say humor is just for fun. We believe it's actually a very serious tool for creating engagement with the topic. If you can make people laugh about a topic, that means they also relate to it. That may also stimulate uh, retention of, of knowledge in this uh, from the uh, learning situation. So humor will be ba will be merged together with the game based uh, learning techniques and hands on experiments. All right, see if I can shift. Okay, so briefly about the uh, the pilot partners. So it's a fairly small pilot we're running. We have uh, our industry partners, Q Tools from uh, Munich, Germany. We have three people from there. We have. Uh, Teachers involved from Germany, Andreas Müller from Spohn Gymnasium in, uh, in Ravensburg, and two teachers from Danish University, Rüsenstein Gymnasium here in Copenhagen, where I'm present at the moment. Then we have uh, from Universität Münster, Stefan Häusler, who's our educational research partner in, in the project, making sure that our initiatives, our initiatives make, make sense from, a, from an educational point of view that what our, our hypothesis for, for how to stimulate uh, a good teaching environment is supported by, by educational research. We have also uh, Wolfgang Dürer from Universität Innsbruck, who's a theoretical physicist working on, on uh, game-based uh, learning techniques, and then myself who's uh, coordinating this activity. Right, so what sort of resources do we all contribute uh, into this pilot? We have some previous experience with uh, from DTU here in Copenhagen in, in translating complex quantum physics into cheerful cartoons and animations. 
it was an, an, uh, a project that was uh, run uh, a few years ago, where we wanted to, to, ex to explore the potential of making uh, high school uh, pupils laugh as their first reaction to quantum physics, because we had experience that like some students were in front of a wall when they were presented with quantum physics, they just couldn't uh, see how to get past that wall and actually appreciate the physics of it. So we thought, why not try to make them laugh as their very first reaction to a new physics uh, concept, say something from uh, quantum physics or here, the Schrodinger cat paradox. So what we wanted to do was to take things that were um, that were sort of in the in the uh, in the popular uh, culture. I mean, at, at the very moment, at, the, at this time, unboxing was a big phenomenon on, on YouTube. I guess it still is. Don't know why. Uh, and why not relate that to Schrodinger's cat experiment and try to see if we could create some sort of synergy between the physics and uh, and uh, and humor. So that's one part. Then there's the game-based learning that Wolfgang Dürer is contributing here in the, in the top part. So he has developed uh, games or tactile games where students are divided into teams. One team play the part of uh, photons or a quantum system in a particular state. And the state the system is in is represented by how the, the, the students walk along the two paths that are indicated here and how they position their legs and arms indicate whether they're in a well-defined state with respect to a certain variable or, or not. Then the other part, the scientist students, they throw balls at, at the, uh, the particle students investigating them each time they hit them with a the ball they are allowed to ask them a certain question so what is your state with respect to your legs what's your state with respect to your arms and then by by hitting more and more uh, particle students with uh, with balls they can build up statistics about what, what state is the particle actually in when he's behaving he or she is behaving in this or that way that way they hopefully hopefully gain some experience some hands-on experience with um with quantum states and uh, being tactile about it, we hope that it will also learn more from uh, from this uh, this activity. So these these sort of analog quantum experiments they will be supplemented by by real quantum experiments. We have the Q tools uh, in the uh, in the um, in the pilot, contributing a wonderful platform called the Quantum Coffer, which is illustrated here in the, in the bottom of the of the screen which is an extremely versatile uh, tabletop quantum lab where you can do basically anything with uh, single photons. You can have entangled photons, single photons, you can manipulate them in various ways and send them into many detectors, study uh, correlations, uh, whatnot. And you basically build up your own uh, discrete variable uh, photonic experiments here. So that will be uh, the experimental part of the hands-on uh, experiments in, in our, in our uh, pilot. And then, of course, we have our very experienced teachers, both in Germany and in Denmark. Here it's, uh, it's Andreas Müller from Spohn Gymnasium, showing one of the quantum coffers that he is already using in his uh, physics uh, classes at, at the gymnasium. Um, and then finally, uh, we have expertise on visualization of quantum phenomena, uh, represented by Stefan Heusler, who's also doing educational research in uh, quantum or teaching of quantum physics in, in high school. So those are our, our researchers and what we want to do in this pilot is like to merge all of this together and create sort of a, a short short course or structure for a short course that can be executed in a, in a high school teaching uh, situation. So basically a schedule of lectures, activities, experiments, uh, uh, game, games, uh, cartoons in a specific way that the, the different activities support each other. So cartoons can be used as an icebreaker for a new, when a new topic is, is introduced. Then that is supported maybe by a small lecture, giving the student more background on, on the topic. Then they go into a, a game-based learning situation where they explore this phenomenon, playing the, the, the parts of the, of the particles themselves, gaining some intuition for the physics. That is followed up maybe by a discussion again in class. What did we learn from this activity? What did we learn about say entanglement or it could also be a QKD protocol. In our case, it would be entanglement. And then that knowledge is transferred into an experimental setting where the phenomenon is, is, is explored using the quantum coffer. So you, do, you deal with the real quantum systems. You try to use the knowledge that you have, you've gained from the uh, from the game games and see how, how do things match. What were the limitations of the game with respect to the real quantum world? What were the you know, where is the analog okay? Where is it not okay? And uh, yeah, to to explore the phenomena in many different levels. Good. 
So as I mentioned, our target outcome is to produce this uh, pre-prepared schedule for, for, uh, for uh, a series of activities in a high school teaching uh, environment. And th this is where we are at the moment. So we all met up in, uh, in Munich in mid-November for a two-day seminar at Qtools, presenting all our, our ideas. We've also they've done that uh, previously online. It was really nice to meet in person and have just two days set aside to discuss how can these different um, tools be merged together and support each other. And during these, uh, these two days, we played with the quantum cover to figure out what are the limitations of it, what are the, the benefits, how can it really be used? What part of it is too complicated for high school students and where, which part of it can they really appreciate? Where can we stimulate creativity and curiosity and all of this? And we tried uh, the games as well to see how, how, how easy are they to understand? How do we need to modify the rules to, to make them fit with our, our pilot here? We discussed the cartoons to see how could, they, how could they fit into a schedule as well. And we also discussed how are we going to evaluate this? So we came up with a, a schedule, which is uh, just a screen dump of it here on the right side. How do we envision that uh, this activity could be executed in a, in a high school setting? And of course, we want to evaluate it as well. We want to know if our alternative approaches to, to teaching, if they are really beneficial, or if it's only something that is worthwhile in our minds. And do the students really learn more about the phenomena by experiencing them in different ways? And for this part, uh, Stefan Häusler is essential because he will develop pre-tests and post-tests at each part of the uh, of our activities to figure what is this, what are the students' knowledge about this concept to begin with? What do they know afterwards? And then at the very end of, of this, uh, this activity uh, uh, series, we will also conduct interviews with a selection of students to get more in-depth uh, knowledge about what did they actually, how did they appreciate these different uh, activities? So this is the current state of the, uh, of the, of the pilots. We are in the process of translating the, uh, the different things that we each contributing with. Some things were made in Danish initially, some things were made in Germany, in German or in English, and that's all being translated now so we can merge it, merge it together. And we hope to publish our, or make available our findings in, in, about, in a white paper towards the end of, of, the, uh, of this pilot. Once we have implemented this uh, activity series, both in Denmark and in Germany, and, and then made the evaluations of it. I think with this, I will, finish my presentation of the funky project. Thank you. Great, Ulrich. Thank you. Thanks a lot. And now I will come back to Hank. Are you ready to present the QTMS pilot? Yeah, here he is, Hank. Uh, so you have to unmute yes. yourself. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, let me share the screen. It's probably this one. Don't join. F5. Okay. Well, I just should start now in full screen mode. Okay, like this. Uh, thank you very much. And sorry for the confusing because I'm also, well, I'm actually teaching right now. So uh, it's also a bit difficult to divide my time. But um, in our, in our uh, pilot group uh, called QTMAS, what's uh, called uh, Quantum Teaching Materials for Schools, um, that came about, um, if I recall, when we started in this first uh, large session, session in spring, uh, we started with high school uh, members all in one room. And then I believe uh, Kim started a group on, uh, on didactics and uh, ev almost everybody went there except Rainer and, uh, and myself. And I'm grateful to Rainer for that, uh, that I wasn't <laughs> even alone. And um, well, within a couple of, within sometimes we ended up with about 15 people or so. Um, and uh, well, I present them now here. Uh, that should be on the next thingy going here. Um, these are the people that we are currently working with. And we have a very diverse uh, group. Um, so it's a, we, we took a pragmatic approach. Uh, that's, what we, that's the common denominator, uh, may, maybe. But there are people from Italy. There are people from working in Finland. There, most of us are from Germany. But in Germany, there are many different uh, uh, curricula, of course. Um, some of us um, have a visitor's lab. Um, some of us only work in a virtual environment. 
Uh, I'm glad IBM uh, joined us uh, with uh, the, contr the contribution of Kiskit, uh, probably. We will yet have to discover that yet. And in the first phase, what we did is we tried to find a common denominator. What, uh, what is our common denominator actually? Okay, we all reach out, we are all outreaches for high schools, but we set up a mirror board again, uh, similar to the one we started with, but then with our common interests and try to find a common denominator. But um, it, it was my impression at least, that was where we ended uh, about a month ago, um, that, it, that, that it didn't really uh, yield anything, yielded anything. Uh, we are, we were, were, we were a bit in the middle of nowhere. We are, yeah, okay, this is what I do, this is what you do. But um, then I think we realized that that is not our strength. Our strength is, is the diversity, the diversity of all what we do. And we can find our uh, strength in, um, in, uh, in, in just the, um, uh, yeah, the various approaches that we do and try to get uh, the best practices out of it. And we only have just started on that. Uh, Azade from uh, Reiner's lab, uh, she made the first presentation, an actual presentation of, of how things are running in her lab. And uh, suddenly then there was a lively discussion of, oh, you can do this and be aware of that. And I have some information on so and so. And these are the types of, inform these are the types of discussions that we, uh, yeah, that we would like to have in our, in our group. And this is only just starting. And so we had the first uh, one of those, and um, the next one is online. We we, we tend to, we, we we intend to uh, all present uh, our uh, materials mutually, and um, with that we hope to get a lot of cross fertilization because it's a bit odd, and I still find it odd um, that although the laws of physics are so well, they are, yeah, a superposition is not that difficult to, to uh, describe. Um, the laws of physics are all the same, but as soon as it goes to approaches of didactics, it's, it's very diverse, and uh, which is good, of course. Um, what we have got to do is to pick out uh, the best practices. And um, well, also what I would like to do for the future is uh, to have a more solid, uh, say, uh, uh, infrastructure of, of these labs in which we can exchange students and uh, and uh, PhD students maybe uh, for uh, to, to, to learn how it's how it's uh, how it works in another environment with another with another physics curriculum with another um, uh, budget and with another type of university nearby and all these differences and so that we can uh, uh, Pick out the best uh, for that for our own uh, for our own students, but that's that's actually what I uh, what I had to say. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Henk. Um, now we come to the last talk of this session. It's a contributed scientific talk by Tia Chawi from the TU Berlin. A gender sensitive approach to high school education in quantum computing. Siad, are you there? Uh, yes, I'm here. I'll share yeah. my screen if I can. Um, oh. Hank, can you please stop? Oh, do you want to come? I can do it. It's fine. Uh, can you see yep. my screen? Yep. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, my name is Ziad Shawi. I am a PhD student uh, at the TU Berlin, and I'll present um, the project I'm part of, which is Q Explained, and I will go into more detail on like our gender sensitive approach to kind of teaching quantum computing on a high school level. Um, Q Explained uh, is a joint project by Dr. Anna Papa and her research group, which I'm part of, which is a research group in quantum communication and cryptography and Professor Katharina Zimbeck's research group at the HTW Berlin. And um, the goal of our project is to teach high school workshops uh, in different forms and to develop like open educational resources in German because there's actually not many on the, the subject of uh, quantum computing. 
Um, and to introduce uh, teenagers to quantum computing and um, with the overall goal to kind of contribute to a better gender balance in, in STEM fields. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't need, I don't think I need to explain the importance of this in our context, but um, we're very kind of much driven by this, this overall goal. And the, so a bit of a detail about the, the workshops to start with. Um, so as I said, we want to teach the basic understandings of how a quantum computer works to high school students. Um, we quickly realized that quantum physics is necessary to understand these, which is uh, kind of maybe obvious, um, but this is often only covered in later school years, at least in Germany or let's say Berlin, because the uh, uh, program varies from um, state to state. And so a lot of students actually leave school without ever having ever, ever encountered um, quantum physics. So we kind of needed to add that to our workshops. And uh, we design our workshops so that we use um, online tools that are available for free. And so that the students can either continue at home or in the classroom. And um, yeah, I mean, these tools are very well developed, so we don't need to kind of reinvent them. Uh, so we did, on the one hand, we did school workshops uh, that we kind of easily tried to integrate into either a physics or a computer science class. And we also did extracurricular events. Um, the workshops were between one and four hours, even though one hour was always very much like a lot too short. We can't call that a workshop. It's more like a presentation. And uh, due to the pandemic, we had to do our workshops up until summer remotely. But uh, since September, we have been doing them on site and uh, we've had quite a few participants. Uh, the content is quite straightforward. We kind of introduce uh, the way classical computers work so that students have a bit of understanding of like what a bit is and logic gates. Then we go move over to quantum physics by introducing superposition and entanglements. Um, and then we talk a bit about the yeah, quantum computers and uh, light or in particular photons so that we can use them in our these like these analogies in our tools the IBM on the one hand we use the IBM quantum composer on the other hand we use the quantum flytrap um, which are kind of great tools for the students to finally after kind of a bit of a theoretical introduction tackle problems themselves and uh, we also try to make them sweat with some of our exercises um, and we kind of try to also teach, kind of give them analogous exercises for both tools. So the IBM Quantum Composer allows them to kind of program first uh, quantum circuits and get easily easy results and like run them on quantum computers. And then we kind of make them translate the same experiment in a virtual lab setting that is kind of offered by this quantum flytrap on the left, as you can see with the kind of very colorful monsters and photons that are polarized in different directions, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that much about the content, which I guess was kind of straightforward and yeah. And so the first challenge that we had is also not to kind of design the content and discuss what we like decide on what we want to do it, but also on how we present it in like a gender sensitive way. Um, which turned out to be a challenge that wasn't too big, if we're going to be honest. Um, but it's often kind of not the case that uh, physics material is designed in a way that is engaging across genders. Uh, the first thing we noticed was that there's a very, very strong kind of bias towards blue, which, uh, yeah, over the years has not changed much. On the left, I have like a scan of my older brother's uh, physics book that he had in school where everything was blue and on the right i found a website with like um school books for from america and as we can see all the like even though this is college physics but everything that's physics rated is always in dark blue and um there's a very strong kind of connotation let's say that uh blue is like a color for boys and therefore all the science subjects are blue and we kind of did a conscious choice to move away from that in order to not necessarily with the goal to engage, I mean, yeah, to engage more students, but I guess uh, we wanted to avoid that people 
who that the young students are not disengaged by kind of just a simple design of our slides and our material. So we opted either for like a simple black and white design because uh, that's also easier for teachers to print out at schools because schools don't have color printers, at least not in Berlin. Or we opted for like a light green color, which is also in compliance with the HTV logo, as you saw on the first slide. Uh, the second thing we realized was uh, that the examples chosen were also very like, yeah, not too diverse. Uh, again, examples across three different countries. In the middle, we have an example of an uh, exercise in a German high school, like online school book, which is about the speed of a um, racing car. On the right is a French school book, uh, which is a like football again. And on the right, uh, sorry, on the left, we have an English uh, school book, which again uses cars and footballers. And uh, we noticed the same across uh, learning materials for the Berlin uh, physics curriculum. Um, and we again try to avoid these examples, which was very easy in the quantum world because we don't need to describe superposition with like football stadiums, um, but simply with coin tosses and like I mean, light switches, etc. So that was also very easy to avoid. And uh, the third approach was also that when we just when we introduce um, quantum physics to students, a very popular approach, uh, because it doesn't really start with science straight away, I guess, is through as a historical approach. And here we saw if we talk, if we here we see if we talk about the quantum physics, it's kind of impossible to not have a very male perspective. Uh, we all know this picture. And so we wanted to kind of avoid just talking about men. So we actively decided not to talk about historical figures with the exception of Albert Einstein, because students actually liked to remember. They always, they, do you remember what entanglement is? Oh yeah, that concept that Albert Einstein didn't like. Um, and we also have the issue that even within the classroom, the presentation is very small. We try to give a couple of teachers workshops, but because of scheduling issues, we had like very few participants. But even in that setting, we had only one women physics teacher participate in our workshops. So uh, we try to avoid all of this. Um, so now the question is, what did we learn from all of that? And um, so we did kind of, we handed out surveys at the beginning and at the end of our workshops. And uh, I'd like to present kind of three different results, let's say. Uh, the first one is to compare our two one-off outreach projects. Uh, events, sorry. One was the Girls' Day. The Girls' Day is a yearly event in Germany uh, where young girls can skip a day of school, let's say, in order to attend uh, workshops kind of related to everything that is science and technology. And uh, due to the pandemic, we had to do this as an online video conference. This, on the other hand, allowed us to kind of have a wider reach and have participants from all over Germany and not just in Berlin. The other event we had was a hackathon, which has a misleading title. It was initially planned as a week-long event. Again, due to the current situations, we had to shorten to a one-day event. So it was the same workshop that we held at the Girls' Day, which were both four-hour-long workshops uh, with the content I presented earlier. And, uh, but here we can see the first issue that if we reach out to only girls within the kind of framework that the girls, uh, the, the, that the girls, they already kind of allowed us because they have a great platform, we were able to reach 23 participants, which was a great outcome for this event. And they were all girls and for the hackathon, which we advertised like across schools and uh, mailing lists in Berlin. We had 20 participants, on, of which only four were girls. So that's already an issue. Uh, however, when it comes to the teaching outcomes, the results are, as to be expected, very, very similar or equal. So we asked the, the participants to kind of self-evaluate their familiarity with quantum computing. And we asked them before the workshop and after the workshop how familiar they are with quantum computing on a scale from one to five, one being like they have no idea about the subject and five being very familiar. 
And as we can see that the confidence and their knowledge kind of changed within those four hours and they came out of the workshop with a you know, strong confidence in their knowledge and they were very happy about their, their results. Um, they all said that they knew more before than after the workshops, which I mean, this is kind of a basic requirement on our side, because that would have been a, a big failure if they said no. Uh, but the main thing we were very excited about is that the very, very, very vast majority, all of them said that they wanted to learn more about quantum computing and quantum physics. So these workshops were a great start for them to kind of engage uh, with our world of quantum computing. And the interest in at the girls' day was actually even a bit higher than at our workshop. And they came out of the, the workshops kind of understanding two key concepts of quantum physics, which are superposition and entanglement. Um, now we tried to do the same workshops in uh, school framework, like in the school con context. And here we faced kind of surprise, I mean, maybe not surprising, but uh, kind of, yeah, issues in, in, this, in the sense that, first of all, it was hard to kind of reach out to teachers, it turns out, in Berlin, because due to the kind of pandemic situation, also a lot of them had enough to do as is to kind of redesign their courses. So we weren't invited to too many classes. Uh, however, the classes that we were invited to were mainly uh, schools with a strong science curriculum, um, but they're also in so-called elective classes. So in the last two years of high school in Germany, students choose their focus and they choose kind of, let's say elective physics where they'll have like more focus on physics and informatics. And uh, we ended up with 36 participants, and again, a very, very low number of girls. And, uh, but here again, the results were, as to be expected, similar to the, to the hackathon and the girls' day. Um, so what we did was in order to, in, instead of kind of focusing on the last two years of school, we decided to kind of tackle this issue even at a younger age. And we went to grade 10 classes where the students are 15 to 16 year old and here, um, nine, of the 96 participants, 48 uh, identified as, as women or non-binary. So we kind of had a bit better gender balance. And this was in the, also their physics and technology class. And it was like a mandatory participation uh, in contrast to the girls day and the hackathon where it was obviously a voluntary participation. And to our questions and kind of research, sorry, not research, uh, teaching objectives, the results were uh, equal across gender. In particular, um, the kind of keen interest to learn more about the subject uh, after the workshop was equal for boys and for girls, which uh, was a great thing to see. So kind of we realized that in order to have a better gender balance when it comes to these subjects, that has to be tackled at a younger age maybe. And um, it's also the like the material reaches both uh, genders or all genders, sorry, uh, in an equal way. Uh, so the question uh, is, where do we go from here? So on the one hand, for us, yeah. So this is what I just said, actually. So the key learnings exa exactly was to that uh, yeah, quantum computing can be introduced at a high school level. At like even a younger age than, than maybe one would expect. Uh, designing gender sensitive material takes actually minimal effort. As you saw, it was just very simple approach. And that the gender bias, as we actually knew before, was going to be visible very early on, but it can be tackled very early on and the engagement is equal at an early stage. And so where do we go from here? From like For us, it means concretely two things that uh, we're going to start publishing our material online for the teachers to use in classrooms. And we're currently working on a video series that will be moderated by my colleague Ulrike um, on the subject of quantum computing. And the question that we need to kind of ask ourselves if we want to, or when we continue these workshops is on the one hand, how do we reach audiences uh, and how do we guarantee more gender balanced audience? Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Siad. Thanks a lot to all of the speakers here. That was a long session and as was to be expected, we are late. So we have to merge the 
question and answer and the community discussion section a bit. But first, let us give questions to all the presenters here, uh, all, all seven of them. Uh, so please use the chat function, raise your hands. I'll try to monitor. To see that for the color palette, did you pay any attention to make them color impaired friendly? That's a good question because I'm color impaired too. <laughs> um, to be honest, no, but thank you for, for pointing this yeah. out. That's a very good point, actually. Thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, yeah, especially for polarization, now that you mention it, we kind of used colors to show the different angles yeah. of the waves. But so if yeah. you use black and white, that is good for color impaired people. Yeah, I mean, black and white because it's printable and stuff. But yeah, thanks. I, I, I actually, very good point. I'll, 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 I take note of that. Thank you very much. More questions? Let me start with one to Philip. Uh, you said that quantum physics is context dependent and therefore we have to design tests that have to be independent of context. But I wonder, it is in all physical fields that they depend on context. Is it that we have to develop um, tests that are context independent also for, let's say, mechanics or electricity? Or is it, do you think that quantum physics will evolve to a state where we will agree on a core curriculum somehow that is no longer context dependent anymore? What do you think? Uh, thank, you for the, thank you for the question. Maybe I did not make quite uh, 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 clear what I meant um, with the term context dependent. I just meant that there are different teaching approaches using very different contexts and using a yeah. very different language to talk about quantum physics. And um, what I meant is that if you if you introduce yeah. students, for example, using one context, then you may not use items from a very different context, but because it may happen that the students don't know the, the vocabulary, just you know what I mean? So you cannot introduce students via polarization um, state and then give them items uh, using the Schrodinger equation or, or a wave function to, to ask something about the measurement process. That was, that was the, the, the thing that I mentioned. Yes, but isn't it in... I'm sorry, I don't hear anything. I don't know if it's only my problem or... Uh, Kim, do you hear Rhino? No, I don't no, hear No, okay, so, okay, good. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> Maybe I pick up in the meantime. Uh, sometimes, uh, so Oksana is back. Sometimes um, internet problems happen. Um, yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry. I was dropped out. Uh, okay. Got the first half of your uh, reply, Philip. <laughs> but what, 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 what I wanted to ask is: Isn't it in other fields that um, people chose um, different approaches? And uh, so I don't know if you <laughs> answer this question in your second half. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I tried to make a bit more clear what I meant. So. Of course, we, you are right. There, there are different approaches in different contexts, but I think the special point about quantum physics is that there is also a different language that is used, right? If we if we think about if we think about the the, the curricula that use like for example a, a historical path or, or whatsoever, they use a full fundamental different language to talk about quantum phenomena and also use quantum phenomena in a different way, such that for example we do when we use about and we, when we talk about a quantum optics approach. So what we what I mean with that is this requires an empirical basis for all of us that we can use, that we have a common denominator, but which is suitable for these different requirements that researchers um, face when evaluating teaching situations. And this is quite different in, in, in mechanics. For example, one can use different methods to introduce um, Newton, Newtonian mechanics to secondary school students. But in the end, we all agree on the topics that we face, right? So we all talk about velocity. Uh, um, kinematics and we all talk about simple dynamics and so on and we can develop um, test items on this as has been done in the force concept inventory but this is a fundamental different case for for the quantum field right thank you now i've lost the 
the chat when I was dropped out. Were there any questions in the chat? Oksana, do you see some questions in the chat? Um, I don't see what at the moment, I do not see new questions. I see the appreciation from Zaki that there are many wonderful resources on the topic. And uh, no, let me check the rows in hand. Okay, there is a new message coming. There's a new message from Marie. Marie to to yeah. Okay, this one you see. Good. Yeah, I see differences in the data you showed because girls statistic is flat before the activity and peaked after the reverse for boys. Can you comment on this? Also, I think that there are differences and the way to welcome them is to realize engaging material with diverse points of view. To give an image, very colored books instead than black and white. So this is, the color is a recurrent topic here. Seat, what do, you, do you want to comment on this? Um, about the, the stats, the reason why um, the boys were flatter and I sort of said that is because um, some of the participants in the hackathon did not fill out the second survey. So we lost some, but the results, so I didn't repeat the whole statistics, but when we compare them to other groups, so for the school workshops, it was always the same. So the, the mostly people said they know nothing or next to nothing about quantum computers. So one or two before the workshops and most of them end up uh, kind of leaving the workshops, judging themselves at a the level uh, four. Um, engaging materials with diverse point of views. Yes, it, I, I totally agree. And I think we, I mean, I, our, our materials definitely work in progress and uh, we're learning as we're going. And um, so I really like working with the quantum flight trap I showed earlier because of the, because it is very colored and it's not black and white. And it kind of, it kind of goes away from classic just school material that is just printed out papers. So they see a lot of colors and monsters and um, that's always kind of a very engaging for the students. Okay, then five minutes ago, I'm I'm told we had a question that we that we uh, that we kept until now from Daria to everyone. Do you think that in the end of the day, outreach can make big difference or the change in the curriculum? Of schools and high schools, the one which will actually do a change in educating people with basic knowledge in quantum physics. So, is it have to paraphrase it? Do we have to wait until curricula change, or will outreach make the difference? What do people think? Just talk. I would propose. Unmute yourself and talk. Um, may I, Rhino? <laughs> yes. Yes, so I have a, a nice experience to, 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 to share with all of you because I, I would definitely say that we, that of course outreach um, can, can have an influence on curricula um, time by time, but I, can, but I can share the experiences from Bavaria and here we had a new uh, curriculum um, um, which has been just starting these, these years. And in this curriculum, their quantum optics approaches have been included. So now uh, students will learn about coincidences with, of single photons, will learn about single photons and interferometers. And this is concretely new because before, uh, always the historical path has been uh, the part of the curricula. So of course, there can be a change. And I think there are other examples in Germany where we, where we reached those already. And I think the same can be the case in, in all European countries. Yeah, yeah, that's great, but the school system is slow. Marilou has raised her hand. Yeah, um, indeed, I think that both uh, um, actions uh, must be pursued because uh, uh, the school system is very powerful uh, to make, uh, uh, to perform a deep change, deep and diffused change, but uh, it is uh, slower, as uh, Reiner was, um, uh, was pointing out. So we, we need to do both uh, things and uh, find ways of uh, using outreach uh, uh, at the moment. Uh, I mean, to start, uh, to start engaging uh, uh, persons, uh, citizens from diverse audiences and at the same time uh, prepare, plan uh, the change and uh, perform the change in school. At some point, uh, these two paths, in my opinion, they meet. 
and uh, they meet uh, in the very early at the very early stage of uh, um, of um, education uh, i want to say by this i mean uh, zero to six years old because uh, if we can bring uh, um, this kind of education into zero to six years old uh, formal education, immediately we meet all the parents, all the grandparents, and uh, everyone that is around the kids, that is almost 80% of the population. And so this is a huge challenge but also very rewarding in my opinion. And that's the reason why, for example, with Qplay Learn, we are doing, we are, I mean, trying this kind of a challenge, collaborating with a pedagogical institution in Italy that is uh, Reggio Children. Thank you. Filippo has raised his hand. Yes, uh, about this, uh... Um, relationship between outreach and curriculum. As a teacher myself, I know that schools are very slow in ch changing stuff. But um, um, I think that you should try to focus on the fact that, for example, a student, a uh, boy or girl, that participate in science, extracurricular activity or whatever, it's also a student in a school. So same uh, human being uh, playing different roles. And so because they are all part of the same ecosystem or community. Uh, so maybe we should also think about um, uh, finding a way to, um, to work on the, learn, on the ecosystem as a general, from a general perspective. So create opportunities to communicate and to, to share goals, for example, because sometimes those outreach activities are completely out of the spectrum of what uh, teachers are supposed to teach in school. And so um, what happened in our con context is sometimes that uh, teachers send their students to those outreach activities just because they know that we learn, learn something, right? And fine. So, but we need to find maybe sort of um, opportunity to collaborate, to design activities together. And, and this is also part of the, what uh, a school as an institution is to, to foster citizenship and this, and to, and to do so, um, we should make the school as part of the uh, bro broader community and also engaging research centers and something like that. So I think we should try to focus more on the fact that we are inside an ecosystem instead of and not just focusing about different actions, but having a common goal maybe could be, could be helpful. At least that, that was maybe helpful in our experience. Thanks a lot, Filippo. We're at the end of our time. Thanks a lot to all the speakers, thanks to all attendants. And we will see again in the afternoon session, I hope. So bye-bye.